Hello, everybody. Ross, uh, Planet X Film. Welcome to the interview series, Zodiac Files, Interview Volume 2. We've got Drew Beeson, author of Sighting In on the Zodiac, host of the Zodcast. Uh, definitely make sure to subscribe to him on YouTube, Drew Beeson channel. Um, you can let him know where to find you, Drew. Other than that. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, YouTube's the best place to start. Yep, for sure. Um, and then you're on the gram as well. Are you on Twitter or... No, no. I'm on Instagram, but not Twitter. Yep. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, definitely find him on there, Drew Hurst Beeson. And, uh, yeah, give this guy a subscribe, man. He does uh, amazing research. Um, basically, I was going to kind of lead off with, um, like, a summary of the book. I don't know how you like to present that best, or do you prefer to go in on, on what your theory is that you have gone deeply into depth on the Zodcast? Of? Yeah, sure, man. And it's, uh, it's all... Uh... You know, it's all in the book, but I do it on the Zodcast, too. So I know a lot of people, you know, don't have time to read everything. So, you know, everything that I have is pretty much on the channel. I mean, starting out with my first video on YouTube, which was a Zodiac video. I do other things, too, but mainly Zodiac. Mm -hmm. And that's before I started the Zodcast, which, of course, is, a, you know, just a YouTube version of a podcast. But then I kind of integrate pictures and stuff. So might as well you know, on YouTube. But, uh, you know, the book is called, like you said, Signing In on the Zodiac Killer. It's uh, a person of interest book. And that person of interest is a guy named Donald Lee Cheney. And people that don't know the Zodiac case that well and maybe just have some knowledge of it, of course, these crimes started in uh, December of 1968. And there was four, what they call four canonical crimes. The last one was in uh, October of 1969. So a relatively short period. And I know a lot of people that, um, you know, a lot of people see movies. So they're aware of the Zodiac case through the uh, David Fincher film called Zodiac. And that was based on a book by a writer named Robert Graysmith called Zodiac. And that's and he based the film off of the book. Well, that book and subsequent movie is about a person of interest named Arthur Lee Allen. And he today is the top suspect in this case. And if people agree with it or not, he'll still win every uh, online poll. There's an online poll in ZodiacCyphers.com, a really big Zodiac website. And uh, he's still in the lead, despite some things that point against him. Well, right, my whole right. theory is, is the person that brought him forward, his friend, who is Donald Lee Cheney, who brought Arthur Lee Allen Ford as a suspect to the police and said, hey, I think my friend could be the Zodiac killer because he told me in night, on New Year's Day of 1969 that he was going to call himself the Zodiac. He was going to go murder people on Lover's Lanes. He drove me to two of those uh, kill sites, one called Lake Herman Road, which was the first Zodiac um, uh, crime that happened in December of 1968. Then he drove him over to a place called Blue Rock Springs Park, where the second canonical Zodiac crime happened on July 4th, 1969. Uh, so my whole theory is is that Don Cheney, the guy that brought forward Arthur Lee Allen, is actually, if you want to call it the lone Zodiac killer, it is Don Cheney, not Arthur Lee Allen. But Arthur Lee Allen could have a smaller role in the crimes, you know, maybe helping him mail some of the correspondence and whatnot. But my whole theory is it's the friend and uh, not Arthur Lee Allen. It was his friend is the actual Zodiac. And there's a lot of stuff that I found out on my own about this guy that uh, fits in nicely with the profile of the Zodiac killer. So that's in a nutshell what the book is about, kind of how I got involved, how I first heard about this guy, Don Chaney, and um, kind of took it from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, best place to get the book is at Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Cool, for sure. So definitely check that out, guys. Um, and as well as the uh, Zodcast, where Drew breaks down uh, that his whole his whole two man theory. So um, you cover like a whole lot on the Zodcast, which I'm guessing you probably go further into the depth in in the book. Um, so, and that's kind of like why I wanted to get you on because there's literally a mind blowing amount of circumstance and evidence of this kind of like ALA, uh, Don Cheney, like two man theory. Um, I actually am reading, um, Zodiac by Graysmith right now. And it, you know, I have mixed feelings about Graysmith now because you know how he was sold, like when the book and the movie dropped to everybody kind of scrutinizing what he says and the amount of like inconsistencies in his stuff. Now I'll say, I really like Graysmith for the timeline. You know, and beyond that, it's kind of like he, he takes, uh, uh, how can I say this? Uh, he takes like a, you know, a, a creative way with his evidence. Liberties, you know what I mean? Creative, so, creative liberties. Here's one yes, right yes. He takes extreme creative liberties, which like, it's it's kind of funny because I, I think Graysmith and the movie are kind of like, you know, as you said, kind of 
entry levels out the movie i think is awesome like if you yeah, just watch it like, it's a great yeah. movie if you watch it as a movie it's an amazing movie you know what i mean as far as like where they point it and what you what they leave you with i can't really necessarily say like i can agree with that but on my first view through the movie um they find those rifles at the end in the trailer and i and i'm like did that really happen because you know that seems like a huge layup if you know I, I don't know if that was supposed to be like before lee allen died or you know or after and they went to the trailer and i don't even know if that he died yeah, yeah. It was before he died he died in 1992 that was before he died so did that really really happen though where they went there and found those rifles that supposedly matched like some of the crimes because um that's one thing where it seems like okay if you're just writing that in as part of the script like here's a little neat little bow where we basically found the murder weapons i'm like okay well there's no big real mi big mystery here <laughs> you know what i mean if we're to believe gray smith that's that's yeah, all they, I'm saying, so. they did not find a gun attached to any of the crimes they did find guns which was interesting right. and they found right. bomb making materials which was right. interesting because of course the zodiac threatened uh, with with a bomb that he that never happened yeah. but he did threaten it in his course drawing, yeah. he threatened to blow up a school bus full of kids yeah and uh so it was interesting to find some bomb making material but none of the right. guns matched any of the crimes no ballistics nothing like that they right. never found anything substantial on two search warrants um uh, against arthur lee allen and he's the only yeah. suspect yeah. in the zodiac case that ever had a search warrant executed on both his home at 32 uh, Fresno Street in Vallejo and on his trailer that was in Santa Rosa. And those, these two search warrants were done at two different times. I mean, they were years apart. So a lot of yeah. people think it was a mistake not to do both at the same time because he had both the trailer and living at the house at the same time. So, so they'd be um, able to move. Things. Yeah, they searched, they searched the home first and, and years later did the trailer. And right. on each, they, they can't really, they saw, found some interesting stuff, but nothing that tied him to the crimes. And he was a convicted felon at that point for child molestation when they searched the trailer and found the gun. So he should not have been in possession with the guns or they should have at minimum uh, confiscated the weapons because they, he was in violation of them. But they didn't even do that. So it's really strange. But yeah. uh, they never found anything directly tying Allen to the crimes. Yeah, right. And that's, I, I, you know, when I first watched the movie, I'm like, oh, well, you know, it was Allen. I got it all figured out. I walked away just like every other average Dave Fincher fan. <laughs> I mean, then I realized oh yeah, the Zodiac case is probably the most complicated case in American history. You know, like I've, I've, I've literally spent years on the JFK assassination. I think I have that way worked out better than I've got this. Cause this is just like, okay, five major suspects, like what, 2,500, you know, maybe oh, yeah. about 2,500 so, yeah, or 3,000 or how, however many. So it's like, whoa, like even, even yeah. Jack the Ripper, I think is more straightforward than the Zodiac, which is like, oh, it really is. It's, it's very it comparable. Is. I yeah. think Jack the Ripper is more. So, you know, then you have to answer the question. It's like, uh, why is Arthur Lee Alley never go away? Why right. why can't he go away? And it's, it's very difficult. Of course, his DNA didn't match. They tested right. it after he died. It didn't wasn't a match. Of course, right. we later right. find out that the DNA came from the outside of a postage stamp on one of the Zodiac letters. Mm -hmm. So Allen's still in play in terms of DNA. Um, For sure. And, uh, you know, but everybody tried to already rule him out over that. But why he sticks around. Somebody once I saw liking it to a bad marriage that you just can't get out of with Arthur Lee Allen. <laughs> yeah. There is a reason for that. I mean, other than the fact that there was a great movie made that, that points towards him heavily and book. Yeah. Uh, some of the evidence against Allen is so strong. Uh, yeah. It's why you can't totally get rid of them. And, well, what is that? What is that evidence? Well, everyone knows the Zodiac and his letters would misspell words and some people thought yeah. well he's just trying to sandbag on how smart he is he's trying to look less intelligent yeah. uh every 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 you know excuse in the book like he would misspell christmas with two s's and yeah. Yeah. i know some researchers said well he's trying to say christ mass like it's it was a catholic deal it's really not yeah. uh Arthur Lee allen would misspell christmas by using two s's and that kind of a, a neat a little tie-in and right. his sister-in-law said that his sister-in-law karen allen got a Christmas card from him one time that had Christmas spell with two S's. And that was before the Zodiac even ever came on the scene. So that's pretty strong right there. So why do some of those things match up with Alan? Uh, the Zodiac used the phrase trigger mech for trigger mechanism. He shortened it to yeah, just yeah. trigger mech. Well, Karen Allen also said that her brother-in-law, Arthur Lee Allen, would use that phrase. So there yeah. was a lot of things like that that pointed Arthur Lee Allen. He lived at 32 Fresno Street in Vallejo. That's like ground zero for the Zodiac crimes. Of course, two of the canonical crimes, one happened in Vallejo at Blue Rock Springs Park. The other happened in Benicia, which was the uh, the first killing on Lake Herman Road, which is just a, a little shortcut from Vallejo over to Benicia. 
So those are kind of, you know, local crimes. And, you know, Ardellan lived real close to the IHOP restaurant where one of the victims worked, Darlene Barron. So there was just so much that would point to Arthur Lee Allen. Plus, he's a creepy guy. <laughs> yeah, that's hugely creepy. Um, okay, so when Graysmith presents this whole painting party with the supposed black magic connection of the murder she supposedly saw take place in, in the Virgin Islands, like I don't know how much of this is Graysmith's civil, uh, you know, his uh, creative liberties, but you know what I mean? One huge problem I have with that whole thing is, okay, there was a creepy guy at the party. It was ALA. Like, that's this is how, like, you know, the whole internet timeline you would read, which I guess follows Graysmith mostly. I'm, like, halfway through the book. And then he was also harassing her at IHOP. My only problem with this whole thing is, is dude, if ALA went around and, and, and posted his face at everywhere that Darlene was, there should be, like, 100,000 witnesses that could say he was at the painting party. He was harassing her at work all the time. Like he was just going there with no disguise, sitting there and acting all weird, drawing all the, like this attention to himself. That doesn't feel Zodiac like at all. That doesn't, you know what I mean? That's, that drives me crazy. There's zero proof that there was actually any painting party. There's that, that no too. definitive proof that that, that ever too. happened. To go to With a like, bunch of cops at it? Yeah, like, well, Michael Butterfield has ZodiacKillerFacts.com, and, you know, Michael is really good about the facts. He reviewed, yeah. he's the first person that reviewed my book and said, man, this is different than any other book. It's factual. I said, thank right. you for that. I <laughs> right. sold on Cheney until I got around to him the second time he interviewed me, and he was like, yeah, man, I think you're onto something. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he, you know, Ray Graceman took a lot of liberties. The planning party just kind of, it's one of those things that you hear early on, and it just kind of builds on itself. On a, you know, a life of its own. That's right. the whole problem. I call it the Darlene Farron rat hole. She dated a lot of people. So, yes. uh, you know, that will send you in so many directions in this case. If you get down who she knew, uh, her ex-husband's uh, uh, crab tree, which is ridiculous. He, I see some people trying to make a case for him being the Zodiac and he was going to kill her and then tie in the other murders. It's it's nonsense. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's just yeah. a, it's a red herring. Like I said, I said that on the last podcast. Uh, you don't want to go down the Darlene Farron road and you really don't want to listen to her two sisters because that'll keep you even deeper down the hole. Uh, yeah. They have yeah. zero credibility. Yeah. One, her name is Pam Huckabee. You know, she went on those early tabloid shows and she pointed to everybody, including Richard Nixon, I think, as being the Zodiac killer. OK, she, and she loves the harassed media. Mike, right? Yeah, when they, that she, time she harassed him on camera. Yeah, I, that yeah, was yeah. super she, awkward. She weird. Mike Mugeau, who doesn't know yeah. a thing. My yeah, yeah. Joe didn't even get a great look at the at the shooter. Of course, he was yeah. with Darling Farron when they got shot at Blue Rock Springs Park, but he doesn't know anything. It's just a, yeah. it's a big rattle. But, you know, going back to Graysmith, he did take a lot of liberties. One was that Arthur Lee Allen's uh, family, which his mother was still alive at the time, and, uh, of course, his sister-in-law, Karen Allen, and his uh, younger brother, Ron Allen, he, he said that the family held a meeting, a family yeah. meeting about the possibility that, that – you know, their son or their brother was the Zodiac killer. That never happened. That never, ever mm -hmm. happened. That's just one of the liberties that Grace Smith took, you know. I mean, yeah. just among the many, you know, yeah. a lot of it, what he does say is factual, but a lot yeah. of it isn't. I mean, the family to this day never really truly believed that Arthur Lee Allen was the Zodiac. That's a fact. Ron yeah. Allen I, and Karen I, Allen never, ever believed it. Yeah, I've heard you mention that before, and I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, it's the, the other thing is, like, it, it's just Alan is so interesting because of all those weird stories around him. Like, a majority of those ha have been you know, the origin is Cheney, as you've discussed on the Zodcast. Um, that other guy who is he, the Italian guy that's the restaurant bar owner that ALA supposedly goes and yeah he's a mob uh, figure Actually, can i be your <laughs> your bodyguard i'm i'm the, you know i whacked this guy the other night on the zodiac i'm like first of all like what what dude goes to sell themselves to be a mafia hitman goes and whacks like a like a like an innocent bystander and then <laughs> plasters it that's like the least like organized crime thing that you can do like dude i've been writing letters to the uh you know the newspapers and i'm by the way i'm a serial killer whacking people can i be your your bodyguard it's like Dude, you can't be one of our hitmen. You're the most like uh, you know volatile person ever. <laughs> like, yeah, like, and they had a bad history together. Weird. They had a bad yeah. history together. So yeah. it, it, it would make no sense. And it also wouldn't make sense that if you are Arthur Lee Allen and you are the Zodiac and you're going to do this stuff, are you really going to trust your friend with all that knowledge? You're going to tell right. him everything you're planning to do before you do yeah. it? For I sure. Mean, not, not Zodiac like at all. Not, not Zodiac like. Zodiac -like. At all. Here's a guy that taunted the police and never got caught. But yeah, you're going to yeah. trust your friend. Yeah. With the facts that, hey, I'm going to call myself Zodiac. I'm going to write letters and I'm going to show you two of the kill sites. 
Yeah. Just I mean, to sell you out you anytime he feels like it. You know what I mean? Because like, yeah. okay, so Cheney played with the with the wax ball, right? So he's got his fingerprints. So then like ball, fingerprint. Uh, how you brought up like his stamps. That's what took me to him. That's what got me on your thing. Like and I, I licked a man's stamps. I can't say that like I agree with your theory 100%, but I have to say I think you have probably the most convincing theory on YouTube because that is just, first of all, let's talk about uh, his name is Arthur Lay Allen. Dude, that's like 30 cops they interview. So you're going to get on camera with all these detectives and all these guys and like, I licked his stamps. Oops. Like, you're going to say that on, like, this. The, that's the most awkward thing in Zodiac history. Like, I don't even know what to make it of is. that other than yeah, try what you're down. If, if he's not insane and Don Chain's not insane. He's yeah. a pathological liar. Doesn't he's appear to be. Insane. Right. He's highly intelligent. It's way smarter right. than Arthur Lee Allen. Right. Uh, why would he do that? Why would he say I licked his stamps? Um, it's not, he's afraid it has of his to DNA be an alibi. He's right. afraid of his DNA showing up. Yeah. No one could have ever be. thought that would ever come out. He was yeah. honestly afraid of it. And you can yeah. say, why would he volunteer that? Because obviously he knows when he says that yeah. he's going to get tested at some point. So I think yeah. he had some fear. To try to get in least, front of it. And like, think of how brilliant that is, though. As yeah. simple as that is, I licked his stamp. So if Don, you know, what if he gets unlucky and it comes from the, bo- the behind the stamp yeah. or the flap of the yeah. envelope and yeah. it is Don's? He's already yeah. covered because he can, he's already had a story made. He can just say, see, I told you so. It, like, what what cop is going to let that slide? Like, d- does, does that actually does that actually stand up when, you, when they pull you and like, hey, dude, by the way, uh, also, you know, nautical background, coding background, pipe, like, all this other they stuff. Knew like, none not, of this, though. Remember, yeah. they knew none of this about the man. That, that's he what I'm saying. Quiet. Not only does your profile fit exactly historically and educationally, mechanically, blah, blah, blah. You, your DNA matches the thing. That's like a, that's yeah. like a close case right well, there. That so would be now, but see, at yeah. the time, they knew none yeah. of this. Nothing. He yeah. flew under the radar. He was right. never even looked at as suspicious. Mm. Well, the first thing that was suspicious was why did he wait so long to come forward? Yeah. He claims that, that, now, see that too. He made one mistake. Don Cheney made one mistake with his story. He first came out and said that this conversation where Arthur Lee Allen is telling him how he wants to be the Zodiac killer and he's going to go to lover's lanes and kill these, these couples. Don Cheney screwed up. He originally said that conversation took place on New Year's Day, 1968. Right. And part of the background of it was that Arthur Lee Allen had already been fired from his teaching job at Valley Springs Elementary School. Well, someone quickly pointed out to Cheney that in, in, that, that uh, Allen got fired from Valley Springs in 1969. So that date is already false. It's wrong. So yeah, what does yeah. Don Cheney do? He moves it up a year. He yeah, moves that, yeah. that, 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 that glorious day where Arthur Lee Allen told me all the goodies to New Year's Day 1969. That's really the only mistake Don Cheney ever made yeah, was starting yeah. out with the wrong date and having to adjust his timeline to fit the facts. Right, so right. it really shows you he's not being honest because he had to move that date by an entire year. And in that story, he says what? One of the biggest things is I went over to Arthur Lee Allen's house that day. I was fighting with my wife. So I drove over to Arthur's house, my buddy, to mm-hmm. cheer him up because he was looking for a job. And that's when he tells me he's going to be the Zodiac killer. And the first thing he does is show him this wristwatch, a Zodiac model wristwatch. And he asks his buddy, Don Chaney, hey, what do you think of my watch? You know, my mom gave it to me for Christmas. I think I got stiff. Do you think it's a cheap watch? And Don says, no, it's a good watch. It's got a nice Swiss movement. Well, what's the problem with that, Don? Well, Arthur Leon had already had that watch for over a year. Yeah. Or he got that watch for Christmas 1967. Well, how do we know that? Because his brother, Ron Allen, got an identical Zodiac wristwatch for Christmas of 67, which Ron <laughs> Allen later verified. So Don's story's already blown out of the water, but he continues to keep it together. And people yeah. still believe him. He's that good of a manipulator. Yeah, that's it's, that was the two big things under Zodcast was uh, the licking the stamps and then the moving of the date. And then I was like, okay, like, if it's not him, these these guys know something. Like I think, like I think ALA, like he, he's starting to look like the Patsy. And I don't know, just all the weird lying and just like that, their weird connections and their whole weird story. And I mean, like the whole picture of those two, which is like the oddest thing in the entire Zodiac case. Yeah, like that friendship makes it is the, the, that friend, the dynamic of that friendship is everything. Yeah, it makes it look like. If it's not Cheney, he absolutely knows something, and maybe, or like the only other thing is like maybe he's covering for someone else that he knows. That's just like I'm not even trying to like hijack your theory, but like I'm just trying to grasp at anything because why all the lying, the weird watch connection, the their whole weird like 
pseudo history of them being at the, the only thing with ALA you know, just to like kind of like go in circles for a bit is like when he tells him he's going to Berryessa and I was, like, I was gonna go to Berryessa but I kept I going up further range of the coast north instead like yeah. what the heck who who says that when when the, when the exactly. cops are pressing you and they're saying like hey dude you're facing some serious crap people are dead and we think it was you and it was like you know what I was gonna go to that place where the murder took place but I went yeah. somewhere else instead yeah, it's like that's such an awkward thing to say you know what, I mean? and like, what does that tell you though they, they right. said that what do you what does that really tell you or anyone that would, would think that, that? that he was expecting them yes. to pin yes. him there like yes, yes. or, or he, was took them off. It. he was expecting it when detective john lynch interviewed yeah. him just about i yeah. don't know eight or nine days after the lake barry s zodiac attack he was yeah. expecting it he was yeah. working as a janitor at another elementary school when John Lynch went there to interview him. And he said, oh, yeah, I was going to go to Berryessa that day, but I went to Salt Point up the, up the coast and said I saw a couple there. Of course, he couldn't verify that. Yeah, can you verify yeah. them? Yeah. Golden words. He was yeah. expecting them. It was yeah. like it was pre-planned between him and Cheney I, you know, to some extent, you know, where they sat around saying, you know, maybe the Lake Herman Road murder already, already happened in in, in, uh, in December of 68. So maybe that happens and, and maybe Don does that kill on his own. And this is just all speculation. But right, uh, right. And then he gets together with Alan and says, hey, let's take credit for this and jerk the cops around. You know, yeah. you're going to play like the Zodiac, but we can't go to jail because they'll never find anything. So right. something like some deni- dynamic like that happened yeah. where Alan was willing to take some of it initially because he liked it initially, getting the blame because right. he was, you know, he was out of a job. He was a child molester. You know, it looked good to him. So yeah. uh, why not? Exciting. So he, he, he somehow coaxed him into at least taking the blame initially or the uh, attention of maybe he was the Zodiac. And I think Alan agreed to it to, on some level. We just don't know what level. Right, I think right. the mastermind and the actual killer was Don Cheney, no doubt. And I mainly base that on, well, a lot of things. Here's one that people don't think about much, uh, at least at the Lake Berryessa attack. That's the mm-hmm. attack we get the most information from. Why? Because yeah. Brian yeah. Hartnell survived that attack. Uh, right, Cecilia right. Shepard was alive for two days. Uh, it was a knife attack, of course. They were stabbed multiple times. But Brian, uh, the Zod- that's where the Zodiac was, for the people who don't know, was wearing this famous hood over his head, yeah, yeah. like an executioner's hood. It had a Zodiac cross circle logo, which was his uh, trademark, uh, branded yeah, yeah. right there on that thing, you know, the overhead uh, hood. Yeah, and bit, uh, yeah. Brian Hartnell was a really smart guy. You know, he was a college student at the time. He went on to become an attorney. He was just very astute. He engaged the Zodiac in conversation. So his account is the best account we have of, right, of everything, right. of what he saw, because uh without brian we don't know the zodiac was wearing that logo we don't know he's wearing that hood but uh, but weird enough at that attack when the zodiac approached brian and cecilia he never said i'm the zodiac killer or anything yeah. weird like that he just said hey i just want your money be calm i just yeah. want your car keys i'm an escape car car the word zodiac but he's wearing this bizarre outfit right uh yeah. but well, thankfully, he, he makes that cover car. story yeah, it's, and kind it's of like the only and time he ever did that. Like, well, only we time it. he ever did that. But but thank God that Brian survived. And I don't think he meant yeah. that to happen. I think. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, Brian just managed to get lucky. I mean, he stabbed Cecilia more, but she was thrashing around crying, you know, obviously hysterical. And that probably led to, you know, her wounds being a lot worse. But thank God we have Brian's testimony. And he has an over aggression towards women. Um, he he killed when he killed Darlene. You know, Majot survived. I mean, I don't know if that's a weird coincidence that the guys survived, but well, two of them uh, did. Yeah. Um, the anticipation yeah, is he was more aggressive towards towards the women. How it looks, you know. Yeah, it but, does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. He was definitely appears to be more aggressive towards the women. I mean, David Faraday was a guy. He died in the first attack at Lake Herman Road. Some yeah. suspect that's why the Zodiac killed Paul Stein alone because. He's getting some grief of like, oh, you're going to, you know, big man left the men, you know, the men survive. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. maybe he kills Paul Stein just to kind of make up for that. Because I think so. Yeah, I think but, so. But anyway, um, my, point, my point is about yeah. Berryessa against Allen is that Brian Hartnell, when he survived, he gave such a good description. Well, one thing that's important about that is the Zodiac came at them first. He's walking down a, a slope. He's got a gun. Where? In his right hand. He attacked him when he when he attacked him with the knife. The sheath was on the, the Zodiac's left hand side, but he's stabbing him with his right hand. Arthur Lee Allen was left handed. Mm-hmm. He was not the attacker there. He was left handed. I don't Andrew think he was very yes, refers to the fact that he could write somewhat with his right hand because it was a scourge back in the day to be left handed. So the mother was trying to get him 
you know, back in school to try to write with his right hand. He was left-handed. He could not, you know, stab someone with his right hand. And people never even pick up on that. So Arthur Lee Allen is a, is a non-starter at Lake Berryessa, number one, because well, he's left-handed. That and the, ba the bad feet coming down the, um, the slope and walking. Down. Yeah, that's a lot of walking walk. for bad with feet. So. With gout in your feet, yeah. that's a long walk. Yeah, but I don't yeah. like him for Berryessa. That, that whole, it's like, you know, like that sandy complex, that's all walking everywhere. Uh, all do you have anything on the... And, uh, and, you know, down a slope and up a slope. A lot of walking yeah, was yeah. an Arthur Lee Allen. And uh, the Paul Stein killing. Uh, it looks like, they don't know for sure, but it looks pretty much like the Zodiac killer shot Paul Stein point blank from the back seat of his taxi cab. But mm -hmm. from the, what you can tell, it's definitely a right-handed... The gun was in the right hand. So Allen is left-handed. He's not going to shoot yeah. right-handed. He can yeah. write somewhat with his right hand, you know, in, in his handwriting, but he's he's a left-handed guy. So yeah, they Allen do the whole – I'm glad you pointed that out because they do the whole ambidextrous thing with him, and they go, well, he can write with both, so he can shoot with both. Right. He can stab with both. This guy's like he's a superhero. Like right. his friend Norman Bedro uh, – Allen's friend uh, Norman Bedro said, and his name was Arthur Allen, he said he was left-handed literally and figuratively. That's yeah. how he regarded yeah. Arthur Allen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have anything on the weird guy uh, spotted at Berryessa uh, uh, stalking those three girls? Um, and then they have that composite sketch. It doesn't really look like the the other the other dude from you know the other composite sketch, but they, no, there's nothing no. like him. You know, yeah. uh, some people say that it looks like oh, yeah, Bucky Stewart. I think if it, if you know anything about the Zodiac Killer hoax theory, which is Tom Horan's. I like Tom Horan a lot. I think he's a good guy. We actually get along well. Uh, He's, he's, he's a big fan. I'm just finding out today of my D.B. Cooper suspect. But, uh, you know, obviously, Haran and I don't agree on who the Zodiac was because he thinks it was a bigger conspiracy. He thinks the park ranger, Dennis Land, probably did bury us uh, and that uh, uh, one of the detectives in uh, the Napa PD, Hal Snook, wrote the letter. So, you know, he's a smart guy and we don't agree on on these crimes, but I, but I like him. But, uh, but the, yeah, the voyeur is obviously not the Zodiac. Yeah. Uh, it shows him with dark hair, and Brian and Cecilia both saw the Zodiac hair coming through the eyelets of the mask, yep. and they yeah. both said it was brown. Yeah, and I was just, uh, this, uh, I was just going to get to that before you brought it up, and that's like the, the hair coming through the uh, eye holes. Like uh, ALA doesn't have a whole much hair, and like I definitely don't see his little like tiny little bits like coming all the way through the eye holes. No, he'd have to be wearing a wig, right? Yeah, but, and yeah, that's, yeah, and that's another a greasy assumption. wig. Like a greasy wig, so a yeah. Greasy wig, and then why would you wear a wig under a hood where it yeah. could easily fall over your face when you're walking up to Brian Hartnell, who's six seven, handling a six, gun seven. <laughs> or mean, a knife? It's like you're gonna shoot yourself. Like. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna, you might be getting in a physical tussle, which almost happened uh, with Brian. You know, he almost made a play on the Zodiac's gun until Cecilia told him, "Don't do it." Yeah, I wish he he's going to be wearing a wig under a hood. I mean, if that goes over his eyes, what is, you know, he's going to have to rip the hood off, and he's by that yeah. time you're already on the ground. I mean, it's yeah. too much of a risk. He yeah, the not fight wearing over. a wig that is a yeah. huge leap. Yeah, it's. I mean, even like because he says, uh, you know, I don't look how I look normally when I do my thing. Like, I don't even picture ALA wearing that Widow's Peak crew cut. And then if if, if he puts on freaking glasses, it's just ALA wearing those boxy '70s styles glasses. So he's still his face still looks exactly the same. You know what I mean? So I don't just see someone. It's not like Clark Kent. You put the glasses on. I'm like, where'd he go? You know, like yeah. <laughs> like and, and Donald Falk at the Presidio, who who people pretty much agreed saw the Zodiac killer, yeah. said he saw uh, ALA in a lineup, and he said it's not the guy I saw. You know, right. That's when Bauer had the, the – he said the guy I saw wasn't as heavy as this guy. Face yeah. was different. You know, he didn't he didn't pick up on ALA at all. And Bauer was like, well, you know, this guy, this guy, this guy. And yeah. he even says that in the video where he was kind of leading him. Like, isn't it him? Isn't it him? Like he did Mike Michaud. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, Bauer didn't take the bait. He said it's not him. Yeah. Not and that's like – like that's like the one guy confirmed that like probably saw him as we said. And just like, again, that's further thing. Um, as far as, you know, people always talk about the, uh, the hood at Berryessa and you've mentioned, uh, the executioner character, the high executioner or whatever in the yeah. Mikado. Um, can you just give us your breakdown of like, what? Well, I mean, obviously it's the daytime for me. I mean, I think he was, I think it was partly Mikado, but I also think because it was daytime, he was worried about like the boats and stuff coming by because that did happen. The guy that found Hartnell, you know, was they heard their crying and it was a boat. So it was like, yeah, I mean, OK, if you did that without a mask off, it's like they might not be close enough, but they could they could possibly 
you know, partly see kind of what you look like and ID you, even though far away, right? So no, I'm thinking, that's like, it's, that's a good it's, point. It's Why not wear a ski you know? mask? Why do you have to wear this intricate, intricate uh, pull over your head that looks like an executioner? There you go. And, you, uh, you know, because this works against some people's theories. And what Hartnell said at the time, and he said later on when he did the, uh, this is the Zodiac speaking documentary that came out in conjunction with the film was that the cross circle logo over the chest was done. It was symmetrical. It yeah. was done with care. At least of his words, he said yeah. it wasn't just scrawled on with some paint. It looked, uh, you know, m- machine made. These are the two words Brian used. I'm quoting him yeah. directly. Yeah. Machine made. Well, what kind yeah. of machine? A sewing machine. Mm-hmm. Th- this little cross meant so much to this guy attacking them that he did it with care. It was yeah. sewn on. It was symmetrical. You know, yeah. it meant something to the attacker. And he didn't have it done down at the local uh seamstress of course he did it himself so uh uh, don cheney had some sewing skills i was able to find out isn't that interesting Uh, yeah the homemade knife he made leather sheaths for knives uh, yeah. that was one of the things Don did on his with his, some of his free time. He made leather sheaths uh, that were perfectly made with designs on them. The guy was highly skilled at making things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Brian Hartnell said the knife at Berryessa looked homemade. The sheath looked homemade. Yeah. Don Cheney could make knives. He sharpened his own knives with whetstones. He was an avid big game hunter. Avid. Yeah. I mean, the guy would go hunting for days and, and shoot big game, and he would cook it, eat it, skin animals with knives. You know, if you're going to go stab two people in the back like that, you're probably a little bit. If you even if, if you let's just assume he never had done it before, you at least know what it feels like to put plunge a knife through some form of flesh, be it a big animal or something first before you're going to be. I mean, I couldn't do it. I mean, I'm not a hunter. I couldn't I just just the feel of that, especially he had a gun, you know, maybe just go pop, pop and run. You know, I mean, yeah, of course, like all the other ones. Yeah, he, he brought a gun with him. I mean, that's how he got them tied up. He you know, Zodiac started out with a gun first. Then he got them tied up. He had, you know, each other tied them up. You know, Brian, uh, Cecilia tied up uh, uh, Hartnell, and then uh, he tied her up or whatever, and then the Zodiac tightened the knots up because they were too loose. So uh, that was that. But you, my point is the guy, you know, he had, had used knives before just to be able to go through with something that gruesome, in my opinion. But, hey, guess what? Don was a guy that was all about knives. Yeah, absolutely. And that's like um, goes back to the uh, – Tim Holt, Wheel of Death, that you posted on the Zodcast this morning. You know, it's got the by fire, by gun, by knife, by rope. And then so, it, for whatever reason, it seems like Berryessa uh, fits into that weird by knife. Fell into the knife, cat, fell into the knife and, if, and that's what I was talking about with Michael Cole's new book. He's been yeah. working on these books for years. I mean, I remember he had a blog for years. And uh, I never talked to him. I sent him an email once, didn't hear back. No big deal. I'm a busy guy. Uh, because I knew what one of his theories was. And that he felt that the Zodiac had celestial navigation training or knowledge of celestial navigation, uh, how the stars line up and how to navigate by it. Of course, the Zodiac used a compass rose on the Mount Diablo letter where it had north, south, east and west. And he made it he made the Zodiac cross circle logo into a compass rose. And he put north, you know, meaning this is a compass over Mount Diablo. He's using radians. So Michael Cole's theory is, is that he would try to kill people in these different quadrants lined up by the radian and one might fall into the gun category. And then one might fall into, like you said, Berryessa with the knife. So uh, that's based off of what we believe is the Tim Holt death wheel from the the Tim Holt comic book, which was Tahoe 27's fine from the Zodiac uh, forums. And that was a brilliant find by her. And uh, and then in the first place we saw that with the Zodiac was what they call the Halloween card that was sent to uh, reporter Paul Avery and yep. it said on the back by knife, by gun, by fire, or whatever on the back. So that was the first introduction to those words. And she yep. finally yep. figured out, wait, look at this comic book. It has that. Now, I also have heard, I think Tom Boyd even said that he's seen a couple other uses of the death wheel and, uh, and maybe another comic or somewhere else. But it right. looks to me like it definitely came from Tim Holt. And yeah. then I believe Michael Cole's theory it sounds so good about these murders were lined up by what radian they yeah. fell on. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just this masterwork to him to have to carry it out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I think uh, it was your first episode today when you presented that that theory. I don't know if you mentioned it before, but uh, yeah, I think there's something definitely to that. It seems uh, seems certain real, realistic. And then he uh, was that a sharpie that he wrote the uh, by knife on the on the car door at, at Berryessa. He obviously uh, left that that handwritten, I guess. Uh, yeah, it was it was handwritten. Actually, I, it was funny. It's funny you mentioned that because I was watching. Uh, 
that part again from uh, the, the documentary, the best documentary done on the Zodiac, which is called This is the Zodiac Speaking, that was done with the movie. And then they have a That's long it. part in there with Brian Hartnell. And, you know, after that, Brian Hartnell agreed to participate in that. And after that, he said, I'm not going to do it anymore. Like, this is it. So it's yeah. great that they got that. But yeah. they, it's the part in there, and I'm sure you know it, where they went to the Vallejo Police Department and Brian's looking at his old car door. Yeah, they have, they have the door saved. Yeah. 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 yeah, they have it saved. It's wrapped up in plastic or whatever. And he's looking at it with uh, the profiler. I think it's Sharon Pagan Hagelin, uh, Hagen or whatever her name is. It's in the, uh, you know, she's a profiler they use for that series. And uh, he's talking to her and he says, they didn't have those pins back there. What did, what, you know, back then, what are they called? And she said, Sharpies. And she said, yeah, those didn't exist back then. And Brian's just looking at his own car door in the evidence room saying, look at how well this is done. Like this guy was OCD. And you have to really listen to that part because they have, don't have it where you can really hear it that well. But he said, this guy is like OCD. Like, look how neat he did this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, without a Sharpie, it was just a, a mark, you know, a, a, some kind of like a marks a lot back then before Sharpies existed. Yeah. But it was a fine point like a Sharpie. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's talking about how OCD it was. Well, one of the things I found out, it might not be anything, but you notice that the Zodiac on Brian Hartnell's car door has first, he has a Zodiac cross circle logo. Mm -hmm. Then he has the, the number dates of his first three attacks. He's got yeah. the dates of Lake Herman Road. He's got the dates of Blue Rock Springs. And then actually that's at Berryessa. So at Berryessa, he just writes out the month. He puts, uh, you know, September and, uh, you know, 1969. And, and people are like, I wonder why he did that. You know, why did he write September? Obviously he knows it's a nine. Why wouldn't he just put a nine? Well, if you take the dates going up from the last three, it makes Don's birthday and they completely line up with, uh, with the uh, with the cross circle logo, because the first word is it's the yeah, cross circle yeah. logo. Then he wrote Vallejo and uh, the middle word of Vallejo is like the E in Vallejo equals five. I mean, anyway, it's like um, E, the E in Vallejo lines up with the cross. Well, E, if you count that in the alphabet, makes a five. So if you go down to the first two dates, it equals Don's birthday, which is April 25th. <laughs> So I thought that was kind of interesting, but it meant something to the Zodiac when he did that. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Time, he spent time to write on that car door. He didn't just, all he had to do was scroll the cross circle logo on there. Maybe a Z, or he could have just put Zodiac. But he, he sat there, no one could get caught, and he spent time to do that car door with yeah, that marker. Yeah, yeah. It took time to do that. It yeah, meant yeah. something to him. I agree, yeah. And, like, everything he writes is, like, um, verticals and horizontals, like the Paradise Slaves to uh, Avery you know, like he, for what, and I know there's that other, what, that storefront or whatever matched it. So they thought that he maybe got supplies there or whatever. It was that similar kind of a uh, vertical text, but yeah, it seems like everything he does is like a, a vertical and or horizontal lineup. I mean, a lot of it, you know, obviously the ciphers again, not a cipher guy here either, but uh, not either. <laughs> it, it's interesting. It's definitely interesting. Shout out to Dave and those guys for uh, cracking the 340 though. That was super wild uh, for, yeah. you know, it happened 51 years later. <laughs> um, That's exciting. I mean, it would have been nice if it led to a little bit more about who it, who it was, but yeah. uh, they didn't really expect that. You know, yeah, that's the fact exactly. that they broke it. But, but you know, one thing that it did do when those guys broke that, it it, it, it illustrated how much more complex this cipher was. Yes. It, it, and and sure. the, the, in the background of the guy that made it. Yeah. Oh, that's real quick. I love when people say it was uh, that teacher that broke the first one. Just I, I know that you're on, uh, you that know, Reddit and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I love when people but like they, they're like Grace. Well, you know, obviously it was Graysmith, and I'm like, yeah, it wasn't Graysmith because he was there like working in the office when most of the letters came in, and then it would, you know, I don't know. I find it ridiculously hard to believe like someone could be standing there when the piece of Paul Stein shirt fell out and and like be the guy that sent it. You know what I mean? I, I think it'd be pretty, you know, not to say it's impossible, but I just think it'd be super tough to keep your cool for that long, you know, like being around all those people in that small circle, you know, maybe it could have been one of them, you know, like I'm not a detective, but I'm just saying, I, I think someone would break under the pressure of like, eventually you would say something that someone would be like, wait, what? And then they would link you to some, you know, some situation that would, you know, incriminate yourself. Yeah, um, I mean, everybody's a suspect. I mean, yeah. you know, there's a guy that has a YouTube channel. It's all about Don, Don, Donald Gene Harden being the Zodiac because he yeah. broke the first cipher, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. that way the Zodiac can still claim he's crack proof because, you know, he yeah. broke his own cipher. No, so, no, uh, no, I don't think you know, so. Harden's, I mean, Harden's a smart guy, but he had, he had yeah. eye surgery. And one of the things that rules these yeah. guys out, at least in my opinion, they yeah. don't have the physical body type that was seen by the primary witnesses. Yes. Yes. They I agree. all saw a stocky man. 
I mean, right. there's no way around that. Every witness to the Zodiac said some form of heavy set, stocky, or barrel chested. Yes. Don Harden is not that way. Karen Penn is not that way. These guys are like, there's plenty of pictures of Don Harden. He is not anywhere near stocky. Most of these guys are like bean poles. I mean, yeah. They are yeah. not stocky. They don't have, I mean, uh, Cecilia Shepard at Berryessa said fat. She used the word fat to, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it was like, you know, the, and, and Brian even said, yeah, he had a pooched out stomach. I mean, you heard that at, uh, at the Paul Stein shooting too. He had the kind of a beer belly on him. Uh, yeah. no, trust me, some of those guys were bean poles. They did not have a beer belly. They weren't stocky. I don't care how many coats they were wearing. A skinny guy in a heavy coat <laughs> looks like a skinny guy in a heavy coat. Yeah, so especially you guys to me are ruled out right there. Yeah, especially Larry Kane. If they're like two or three feet shorter than the the description, like absolutely no way I'm I'm buying it. Um, yeah, same with Phillips Crabtree. He's a little bitty guy. Uh, yeah. Larry Kane is a small man. I think the highest height they had on him is five eight, which isn't a deal killer. But he's yeah. small. He's little. He's not stocky. He weighed about 155 pounds. He's not, he's a non-starter for the physical descriptions. Plus. Kane looked nothing like that sketch. Nothing. Heavy, heavy Brooklyn accent. Like, so, uh, you know how, the, what's that, the 74 la- letter that supposedly comes from uh, Rochester, New York. So a lot of people were trying to say, like, well, who has a Rochester connection? And it's supposedly Kane had some Rochester, New York connection. I, I mean, it's it's interesting that they you can pin some of those people, but I, yeah. I don't think that's enough to, you Kane know, it's is- not <laughs> Kane is weak. He, he did live in proximity to Donna Lass when, uh, then this is interesting how it ties into Don Chaney. Uh, yeah. Harvey Hines was the guy, he's an ex uh, a police detective. I can't remember the little town he's from. He said it wasn't San Francisco, little town in California, you know, he's retired and uh, he wanted, he, you know, he really dedicated himself to solving the murder of, or not murder, Don, uh, the disappearance, we'll call it, of Donna Lass because we know yeah. they never found her, right? Right. Uh, and he dedicated himself to that. So at some point he, he gets, he just is uh, convinced that it's the Zodiac uh, that, that is responsible for Donna Lass. Well, the Zodiac that we know of, at least in the Ford and Canonical Crimes, never abducted anybody. He never sexually yeah. assaulted anybody. So the Donna Lass never, never appeared again. You know, maybe he killed her and they think that he was buried, you know, and, and, and it was on the map and everything. But um, a, a, a police officer from California contacted me one time through the YouTube channel and said, man, I've been around. He goes, I like your work. I think you figured it out and all this kind of stuff. He said, I can tell you about, he brought up Harvey Hines. He said, everybody hated this guy. All the other officers, when he came around or he asked questions, they said they hated him. He's just, they, I don't know what it was about him. And, and uh, I cooperated this with somebody else. He just said he was really disliked. And he also yeah, told me, he said, if you brought up Don Chaney around Harvey Hines, he would get extremely like, 10 times more angry, like wanting to fight you if you ever even suggested Don Chaney could be involved. And I thought, man, isn't that odd? You think maybe Arthur the Allen or just any other, you know, Arthur the Allen would be better. That's his biggest competition. And they just said, no, it was with Don Chaney. If you ever brought him up, this guy would get livid with you. And I'm like, man, was he protecting him? You know, and I've, I've always kind of like was interested in Harvey yeah. because of those stories. And then another guy wrote on one of my um, one of my videos, the same thing is I heard what you said about Harvey Hines. He goes, that's true. Uh, and these guys are totally unrelated. They were both law enforcement in California said this guy, nobody liked him. And he didn't quite write the Don part, but kind of the part about nobody liked the guy. And, you know, a lot of what you say is true. He just left it at that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've heard you, uh, cover that stuff before. And, uh, I definitely agree. I mean, just, just going wide picture, just to make some complete generalizations. Like, I think like, if it was, if it, if ALA did any of them, which I'm not so sure, I think it would have just been those, those general, you know, the general main crimes. Although it seems like it wasn't Barry Essa because he's terrible for that. And it seems like it yeah, might not right. even have been Paul Stein because you think Falk would instantly recognize ALA. I mean, like, exactly. dude, is a, and it looks kinda, like a right-handed, a right-handed kill too. Stand that that too. So that would kind of be like a, a, a dead giveaway. I think if, if Larry Kane did any of them, I think maybe that would have been just Don Alas because he, he worked at the uh, he worked at the hotel. Was it a hotel or yeah, a, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. So he yeah, worked real there. Estate, real, he was in real estate. Yeah. So like, I don't have him for any except for maybe that one. And like, really, it's like a disappearance, like you said. So there's like basically no evidence. So it's yeah, other than like founder. the letter. Yeah, it's the letter. It's the taking um, you know credit letter that he sent. And then also like, I have that same problem with like Cherry Joe Bates. Like, I think like that looks like a Ross Sullivan. 
However, I don't think Ross Sullivan was like the Zodiac at all because like he's too tall. He, you know, I know he moved up to the Bay Area, blah blah blah. But like, San, yeah, San nothing Rose. else fits. Nothing no, else fits. Santa Cruz, sorry, Santa Cruz. He moved up to Santa yeah. Cruz. Yeah, no to the near, near, near. No one can ever put Ross in, in uh, Vallejo. Yeah. Or and possibly he, didn't have a car. So he didn't have a car. Like, he, was, he was known not to have a car at the time. I mean, plus he so, had horrible mil- mental illness. You know, he was yeah. eventually committed. He had spent three years in a mental institution in the beginning of the 1960s. I think it was uh, mm. 1960 through 63, so three years before the Bates murder. Uh, Ross had had some serious mental problems. And I always yeah. hear about this. Well, Ross had cryptography class, you know, somewhere. He took one class. Like- I've never even seen evidence of this. If he did, that's in- kind of interesting. Yeah, I've never seen evidence of it. He wrote I've a paper, I think, an essay or a dissertation is the story. And, you know, I'm sure if there were evidence, it. you I've would have found seen it. A document. I never, I, you know, I don't think he's much of a player even to get to the bottom. But I'd say, can you at least show me this? I've never <laughs> seen actual proof he had a cryptography class, but whatever. Yeah, it's just the, uh, you know, he 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 dressed differently. There's that weird note the military, uh, inscribed yeah. on the desk. Yeah, in the military boots. And then he, after she died, he came in dressed differently. So like I thought that was peculiar. And then uh, the DNA in her nails didn't match. You know, her her boyfriend. That's another ex boyfriend thing. Going back to what we were saying about yeah, Darlene. So it might have been his friend. <laughs> So. To me, the boyfriend, of course, you know, the local police there still believe it was the boyfriend. Yeah. DNA aside, it looked like he had some friends. Uh, and uh, that was a violent attack. I mean, she was yeah. almost decapitated. None of yeah. the Zodiac attacks were to that level. It did seem personal with Bates. I mean, she was almost decapitated. Very violent struggle. It, it, uh, yeah. It's just yeah, the I, thing I about. I don't think that's a Zodiac kill. Um, man, I always forget her name, but the pregnant girl that had her daughter that was picked up in the South Bay, it's like that's, you know, the, the whole dis, you know, uh, when he took the, the nut off the, off the wheel, it's that whole thing about disabling the cars. And, you know, it's just, it's a weird coincidence, I guess, which, you know, we know coincidences in the Zodiac case, but I mean, it's, I don't know. It just, although she, the pregnant lady, she said when she saw the composite, she said it was Kane. So like, if anything, maybe Kane picked up her and he did Donna last, but I don't know. It's so weird. Funny because when she got to, when it, after it happened and she went to the, uh, to the police station, she pointed at the wanted poster for the Zodiac and from the, the Presidio sketch, which looks yeah. nothing like Larry Kane. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, did, when they put out that first one, isn't it wrong before Falk tells them two days later and they fix it? So that Presidio one didn't even have the Widow's Peak, and right? It had a couple things wrong. Like I, so. I, don't, I don't remember them ever fixing it. Yeah, Falk yeah. looked at it after the, it was based on the Robin's Kids yeah. descriptions, and Falk said, pretty close, but this guy was a little more round-faced and uh, yeah. a little stockier. You know, a little bit off. Barrel I, mean, I don't think they ever amended it based on Falk. I think they did amend it, but perhaps they didn't actually make that one public. But I believe there were two. Anyway, you yeah. you you'd probably Kathleen know. Kathleen Johns is who you were thinking of. Kathleen yes. Johns. Yes. And and you know she's kind of interesting. I'm you know I, I lean again. You know her credibility suffers a lot. It's a little she, weird, yeah. The story. But, but she was adamant about the fact that when it happened, that there was children's clothes in the car. Yeah. 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 So uh, what does that tell you? The, the, the killer's out there in the family cruiser. You know he's not selling yeah. kids' clothes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that yeah. means he's got young children. If it's true. Yeah. Well, how many yeah. suspects have young children? Ross Sullivan? Nope. Larry Kane? Nope. Arthur Lee Allen? Young kids? Nope. Just Don on Jane. Jane. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Two young children at the time. Yeah, yeah. So, That's uh, uh, that was a good one by you. I, I liked when you when you pointed that out on the on the Zodcast. I'm sure you did uh, in your book as well. But yeah, I don't know. It's weird. My whole thing is like when he takes credit for CJB and he takes credit for Donna Lass and then he takes credit for Kathleen Johns. I, I, I don't, I'm not real big on, on like the, the cop theory because of like the, you know, the Golden State Killer, oh, every serial, every American serial killer is going to be a cop now, blah, blah, blah. But I'm just wondering if there, you know, maybe he was like, uh, like you said, that, that cop that may have been covering for Cheney, maybe he did have some other connection where he could get him inside information because it just seemed like he was taking credit kind of fast for CJB. And if like, if he was, if he was, yeah, no, no, right, if he was nowhere near it, I got to wonder like, how, how he figured it out if it wasn't him or yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know it's just weird. That's true. And, and Ralph Spinelli. I mean, you wonder if there's a, a combination there. How did Spinelli know that Allen was a suspect? Right. I mean, he probably could have figured it out. Of course, when Gray Smith wrote the book, he's calling uh, Arthur Lee Allen Robert Hall Star. Yeah, the uh, su- su- uh, pseudonym. Pseudonym. Yeah, weird yeah. pseudonym. Isn't it weird that Don Cheney had a class at Bakersfield with a Robert Star? <laughs> yeah, and then also. Uh, 
one of the best ones, I think you said you connected it after you completed your book. And you have a yeah. couple of questions, which I'll let you know in a second. Uh, there's the, this is like the most stacked my chat room's ever been. So shout out to Drew and his fans. Um, oh, wait, I just threw myself off there. What was I just saying? You were, I think you were going to talk about the Bakersfield connection because I definitely oh, found yes, that. Oh, yes, the college. Or the, or the uh, Bakersfield Avery. College. Yeah, Avery and Cheney. The book was done. And the Mikata. Yeah, that was like, I was like, dude, that whole secret pal thing was like, dude, that set off my weird meter like fucking a thousand yeah. degrees, dude. Like, that yeah, was crazy. There, there's two things I found out. I mean, I had already made a case for Don Cheney being the Zodiac killer. Yes, yes, yes. In the book. I mean, I had enough to write a, a good sized book on just him, things that point to him, his background. Yeah. And after the book was done, I found out two things that, you know, somebody, oh, you should have known that before, but he's hiding these things. They're not easy to find. Well, one yeah. was that he'd been in the Air Force for two years. I yeah. did not know that when I wrote the book. Uh, and that's interesting why they was found a wing walker shoe print at Lake Berryessa. That's primarily an Air Force shoe. Yeah, some Navy, but that's a non-slip sole, uh, mainly used by Air Force. You can buy them on Air Force bases. Well, Don was in the Air Force for two years. Uh, kind of odd because usually when you train to be a pilot, you go on into the Air Force for a career. And I mean, it's literally upper 90% of those guys that do that training that he had would go into that as a career. And Don dropped out, which is an interesting pattern for him because he's plenty smart. But mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that at the time. I checked full through. Of course, I thought of it when I did the book. I was like, I wonder if Don was ever in the military because they talk about Arthur Lee Allen being in the Navy. Of course, Arthur Lee Allen's father was a, was, was a Navy pilot, very uh, decorated Navy pilot and a career Navy guy. Uh, Arthur Lee Allen's dad was. And so Arthur Lee Allen was in the Navy for a brief time until he got bounced out in the way that Don likes to call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Choice of terms. And uh, I, I dug and dug and could and never could find that Don Cheney was in the military until I read one of his uh, um, uh, wedding announcements where it t said that he was in the Air Force for two years. And then I was lucky enough to find a photograph in the Bakersfield, California of Don in his flight suit uh, or his, mm -hmm. his Air Force outfit that his parents put in there to commemorate the fact that he was. You know, they were proud of him. He was going to train to be a pilot. And I didn't know that at the time that I wrote the book. So that's a nice little nugget. And sure. then, of course, I find out the Paul Avery connection. Uh, I knew Don Cheney was from Bakersfield, California. So I was just digging through the um, the Bakersfield uh, Junior College. I knew he went to Bakersfield Junior College. So I was digging through their yearbooks online. Thank God whoever did that. They put all of their yearbooks online and they put all of the school newspapers online. It's called the Renegade Rip. So looking through there, it had the little snapshot of, of all the people that worked for the school newspaper. And one of the reporters, it said Paul Avery. And I'm like, oh, that can't be him. Why would Paul Avery have ever been in Little Bakersfield? You know, Paul Avery's from Hawaii. I knew that. And I knew he started out as a newspaper reporter in Mississippi and then went to Texas. He was a sports writer for a while, but never saw any college with him. So I thought that can't be him. Sure enough, it was him. He's yeah, going yeah. to the same tiny junior college four hours away from the Bay Area is Don Cheney. And wait a minute, the same time, this little bitty college, these yeah, two yeah. guys are there at the same time. And then I find out what school production did they do in May of 1953 when they're both there? The Mikado. Yeah. I mean, so you go from maybe just yeah. huge coincidence to this is not a coincidence. That's the genesis of the Zodiac case. I had to be something. When you drop that one, I'm like, it's your, your, your research is cool. Cause at first I was like, all right, I'm going to check out this guy's theory. Like, you know, definitely seemed to be going in a direction. Like I, I liked, you know, the, the energy. And then as you started finding out stuff like that, I was like, Holy crap, man. Like that's, that's gotta be something. I mean, I don't know what, but that has to be something. Like, I, I, I don't, I'm not one of these guys that say there, there aren't coincidences, even though I always hear from law enforcement, we don't believe in coincidences. I do. I think there are, but when yeah. you talk about the sheer odds, of these two guys that were they were born the same year same month donald lee cheney and paul avery and they're going to this tiny little junior college where the freshman class is like 200 people and, and it's only you know freshmen and sophomores it's a junior college 200 people and it's literally shares the campus with bakersfield high school where don went uh paul avery went to burroughs high and they're there in this I mean, they're, they're crossing each other's paths. And later I find out that they knew a lot of the same people. Um, one lady that, that knew uh, Cheney's sister very well, Patricia, also was in a play with Paul Avery. I mean, these guys are all over each other at the same area. And then right. you drop the Mikado bomb on it. That's the genesis of this case. The odds that three major forces in the Zodiac Killer case come together in Bakersfield, California, four hours away in 1953, that many years before the first attack at Lake Herman Road, tells me something. That is the genesis of this case. I did see on one channel, um, they went and interviewed one of those guys who was part of the, 
the Mikado uh, during that era in the SF Bay uh, theater area. Um, I'm sure you've come across it in, in your research. And they were saying like some weird guy used to come there and I think he watched it like five times in a week or something. And he wore like a leather hood and they said he was like cre creep. He was like a fan and they said he creeped everyone out. But I think he had like a mask on so no one could ever see who it was. Like possibly maybe he could have been the Zodiac or whatever, you know, just some weird guy that used to go to the Mikado all the time in SF. So. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stories like that out there that are never really get fully vetted out. They also show yeah. the, the Zodiac film, one of the early ones, not the, the Fincher yeah. one, but the other horror story based off the Zodiac. And uh, yeah. they were trying to catch the killer with this this box and like put your name in it. And there was a guy that did it and they couldn't catch him. And yes, I was gonna, I was, like I was gonna see if you knew about that one because I wanted to yeah. ask Tom about that. The, so yeah, they, they, they had they, the box they had and the box out there. Yeah, it was yeah. like I was here, or he said like I was here or something, but the guy passed out because there was no oxygen in the box, and I was. Like, dude, you may have like just seen you the just zodiac, yeah, but you couldn't see it because you were passed out because you had no air. And then that one guy said, like, oh, that's not what real blood looks like. And like 30 guys like pushed him into an office, and then like they just let him go because it wasn't Z. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's a crazy story, though. That crappy, uh, that, I, I want to watch that movie, though. I do want to watch that movie, even though I know it's trash. Like, I just I have to see it, you know, it looks, it, I don't know, I'm just interested weird. in the story, you know I mean, what I mean? But Avery's connection to that production of the Mikado is, is very is very close. He did a play on yeah. the same stage three weeks before. All his friends were in it. Uh, Bruce Vogel, that played the Lord High Executioner, was a friend of Avery's. Avery was yeah. in the theater at the time, and then yeah. he writes an article in 1970 about how he thinks the Zodiac was influenced by the Mikado from seeing it in a school production. Right. Isn't that odd? I mean, not like a you know a bigger city show or a traveling right. show or uh, from watching it on TV. He specifically cites things he got saw it at college. And Avery never bothers to mention that, hey, I was at Bakersfield when they did it, and my friends were in it, and yeah, yeah. I out or something. It's just odd. It's like he's like he's like worried, like uh, it's someone who knows him, or almost like yeah, like you know, it's kind like of there's more there. Staying away from it purposely, yeah, getting away from it, never mentioning it. He never if I bring it up, he ever you know, went to Bakersfield. Right. If I bring it up, then people are looking into it. So uh, you've got a few uh, questions from from your fans here. So uh, let's smash some of those. Uh, Patty Gimlin, Drew, how did you get interested in the Zodiac case? Uh, oh, wow. I always knew about it and never and uh, never knew it. Never knew it that well because I knew that it, the crimes were in the 60s, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, and then got deeper into it. Uh, I was actually g g having some some voiceover samples done by a guy and uh, had just done a, a, a D.B. Cooper podcast. And I told him that and he said, well, I'm really into the Zodiac killer. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah, I just I eat, sleep and drink that case. I said, I kind of know it, too. And from that, I got back into it. And he was a big fan of like the hoax theory and Haran stuff and Hell's Angels and Blue Rock Springs. But from that uh, meeting him got me reignited into the case. And that's what led me to watching his name was Arthur the Allen again. And this Cheney character, I'm like, and then reading the comments under that video, like everybody's like, that Cheney certainly seems suspicious to me. That was 80% <laughs> of the comments under that video. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think Tom Boyd is hosting that video now, but for, for the longest yeah, time, yeah. this guy Pedro Bosox had it. And all the comments were, man, that Cheney seems like he's lying. He's suspicious. He's weird. And that's yeah. what that's what really sparked me into the case was that video. For sure. For sure. Uh, we've got a couple yeah. more for you. Uh, Matt Falcon. Do you think that any of the non-canical crimes were the Zodiacs? We were kind of tossing that back and forth. You know, I think if, if any of them were, it's the uh, 1963 murders of Robert Dominguez and Linda Edwards, the high school students. Uh, they call it the, the Gaviota, Gaviota Beach murders. Yeah. Uh, they went to Lompoc High School. I've also heard it pronounced Lompoc. I think it's Lompoc High School. And yeah. they skipped for senior skip day, and they were murdered on the beach uh, near Santa Barbara. And... Yeah. Uh, they were uh, shot with a 22 caliber weapon, which is similar to Lake Herman Road, of course. Yeah. And uh, the bodies were dragged to a little shack, and the killer tried to set the shack on fire, but he couldn't. No right. sexual assault on Linda. Um, very, Super X ammo, I think, over there. It's very similar ammo. You know, yeah. couple on the beach, lovers, yeah. On, yeah. you know, on the beach. Near water. A lot of earmarks. A lot of earmarks. I mean, I mean, nothing, obviously, there's nothing physical to tie those two together, but I think of. Uh, of all the non-canonical crimes, I would say, if I had to bet on one, I would say that particular murder, which was, of course, would have been the first in, in 1963. Yeah. And then also somebody made a connection to a cab driver named Ray Davis, and I think that was 62. So that yep. would have been the year before in Oceanside, California, where a yep. cab driver was shot, very similar to the way that Paul Stein was. 
And yep. there was a, a, mysterious, a mysterious phone call that came in after that one. That could be Zodiac. I don't know. There's a cab driver like Paul Stein. He threatened uh, uh, kids. Could have been. You know, and, and, and the lady that wrote that article, you know, uh, said this looks like it could be a Zodiac deal. And, you know, they never took it that took it that far. But that's possible, too. Sherry Joe Bates, I lean against. Uh, yeah. And for me, it doesn't make a difference because you know, Don spent a lot of time in Pomona, California, which is right by Riverside. So his in-laws lived there. So he definitely would have been aware right. of that killing when it happened. Well, to throw ALA again there, even though I hate him as a suspect, he said he went to the town right next door to CJB for a, for a race. What was it? Car car race? Yeah. And it's like, that's another like Berryessa thing where like, Dude, you're purposely putting yourself <laughs> near this stuff. Like, you could easily yeah. get out of that if you just lie and say, no, nah, I didn't go down to L.A. that day, you know? And he, and he also missed work the next day. Yeah, he, that too. And, he, and so. he, had a, he had a perfect attendance record yeah. at, at Valley Springs. And yeah. he was he was out that day. I remember Michael Butterfield told me that there was a little bit of cloudiness over that. But from what yeah. I know, that's absolutely true that Arthur Lee Allen did miss that day, which would have been Halloween day. Uh, October 31st, 1969, because of course, that, I mean, uh, 66, because of course that crime was October 30th, 66. Yeah, I was going to say, Allen was off that next day, which yep. was extremely out of character for Arthur Lee Allen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then um, I was going to ask you, but you brought up Ray Davis because uh, I actually shot a new series called The Zodiac Files. We just looked at uh, the Seaside Slayings, which is uh, Ray Swindle, uh, Johnny yeah, Ray and, Swindle. Ray and, and, and Joyce Swindle, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So that's a very close to be related a 22 near water at a dead end uh lo you know a lovers at night it was uh, it was near um uh valentine's day so similar to the, ho the holiday thing yeah. san diego uh, yeah yeah i was gonna ask you uh ask you about those san diegos but you kind of already brought up ray davis um we got more questions for you and this is kind of <laughs> going back to what i was saying before but i definitely don't think all the journalists or every single person involved in the case is the zodiac however bat falcon asked you do you think paul avery could have been the zodiac <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it, it, I think he knows more, though. I think he yeah, knows more. I, agree. I, I, I agree. saw a guy make a great, try to make a great case uh, for Paul Avery. He said, you know, I'm not really deep into this case, but why not Paul Avery? He's like, look, at, look who benefited so much from, uh, yeah. you know, he made a career off of it. And why was Paul Avery always getting these tips? You know, Paul Avery's the one that got yeah. the tip on Riverside. Yeah. Via the slow boat to China letter that, right, uh, right. you know, of course, Riverside Police said, well, we got it from an informant named Phil Sins, S-I-N-S. Weird hmm. name, right? Well, yeah. fortunately, somebody, I think it was Mike Morford, uh, got to interview Phil Sins later on in life, of course. He was older. I'm sure he's passed away by now, but thank God he got interviewed. And he said, is God is my witness? He goes, I did call Paul Avery about it, but he said, I never sent him a letter. He said, never did it, never happened. Huh. I fully deny it, never sent him a letter. And, and that's what I'll tipped off Paul Avery was a letter that referenced, you know, if this murder is not connected to Zodiac, well, then I'll jump on a slow boat to China, something like that. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's named the slow boat to China letter. But yeah, why yeah. was Paul Avery always getting the scoop? Why? Yeah, that's, why? A, that's a good question. That's a, that's a great question, actually, especially, you know, you guys could check out the Zodcast and see what, what might be the reason that Drew thinks that is, as well as uh, checking out his novel, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So we had, yeah, that was that was that one. And then uh, this is from Red Feather. Uh, what do you think was Cheney's motivation for being the Zodiac, if he really was? Was there anything weird in his childhood, or was he rejected by a woman like Ted Bundy was? That's actually a pretty good question. Yeah, it is. But, you know, they, they also speculate, well, I don't even think it's too speculated. The Golden State was motivated by a, a, a failed marriage or something like that, mm. which really, you know, like he was so violent with the women. But, but Jimmy, right. I don't know any about that as far as his relationship with his mother goes. But I will tell you that uh, as smart as he is, he never seems to hold a job. He's highly intelligent, honor roll every year, Bakersfield High, graduated Bakersfield Junior College, Air Force two years, uh, Cal Poly Pomona Mechanical Engineering, head of the Automobile, Automobile Engineering Society, very intelligent. You're, you're, I mean, Cal Poly Pomona is no slouch of a school to be a mechanical engineer, smart guy, but he never seems to be able to hold a job anywhere. Uh, he, he's always, you know, bouncing around jobs, literally. He works for a good engineering company in San Francisco in 1965 when his son is born. And he can't stay with that job. He eventually starts working for Sandy Panzarella, his, his friend, who was extremely successful financially, uh, started a medical billing company, um, I think Science Dynamics, something like that. And Panzarella made a ton of money. And Cheney's working for him. And that doesn't even last for whatever reason. He just doesn't, like, I think, authority 
and uh, for whatever reason. And I knew he, he fought with his, his wife. He got married kind of later than a lot of people. A lot of people back then got married right out of college. Cheney gets married in 1962. Uh, he fights with his wife a lot. I know that. He calls it friction, having friction with his wife. And they eventually get do, you know, they, 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 they're estranged from each other for a long, long time. And Cheney's estranged from his kids that move back to uh, the uh, East Coast. And Cheney still lives on the West Coast. So even though he doesn't have a job to keep him on the West Coast, he chooses to be away from his children. I mean, I can understand not being away around his wife if they don't get along, but you'd think he would move closer to be around his children that are now on the East Coast. So there is some weird things going on with him uh, that we can't figure out. Why he doesn't he stay at a job as smart as he is? Uh, and it's one thing about Michael Cole's book that I bring up, and you definitely got to check that out because I tell you, you know the case well and all these things. Michael Cole believes that the Zodiac did all of them. He'll tell you that he did everything. For, that he did Bates. He did Last. Yeah, could did be possible. Anyway, he could be right, you know, uh, and the way he ties it all in. But but he does give you, you know, gives you a good overview of uh, the skill set you would need to be the Zodiac and the time it would have taken to do what he did, to do the ciphers, to write the letters, to mail them, is to not be detected. Somebody's spending a lot of time on this. So how can you hold uh, any kind of day job that causes you, you know, to think like if you're doing engineering like Don Cheney and he, he had other jobs that weren't mechanical engineering, but that's what he was trained to be, a mechanical engineer. Yeah. But if you're doing all this stuff, like in your basement or wherever the Zodiac is doing this stuff, you're spending a lot of time. He neatly printed out those ciphers. I mean, you look at look at the rows of the symbols. Well, it's my theory, he did it on a light table that an engineer would have had. Yeah. So he has graph paper under it, so they're totally uniform. And then he yep. does this crazy, scrawly handwriting because he's trying to hide his handwriting. But uh, Cole makes a great point about the time it would have taken. No matter how smart you are, it took a lot of time to do all that letter writing and ciphering, hiding codes in there. I don't see how you could hand, have any kind of uh, – a day job and still do all that. It'd have to be somebody that had gaps in employment or was suffering at their job because they stood up, stayed up till 3 a.m. doing ciphers. So that's yeah. kind of my theory with Don and why he hopped around so much. Yeah, I think the, uh, the whole light table you have, I think is you're the first person uh, I've heard point that out. I don't know if other people have, but I think that's a great point. I mean, yeah, I guess someone could freehand it, but it's, it seems like Not it, easy. It, it wouldn't come out accurately. And it, you know what I mean? It just doesn't it doesn't really seem to uh, make sense. Uh, one thing I noticed when I was reading uh, Graysmith was uh, he says that before Stein was um, uh, shot, I think it was a week or two weeks before, and again, it's Graysmith, so we're going to take it with a grain of salt, people, but he said that he was held up by two men on a stick-up, and he uh, hypothesized that it could have been a dry run for the, the possible murder. Um, I just thought that was interesting because you, you kind of have a semi- uh, Two man tandem theory, even though you know your evidence does seem to uh, point to Cheney, it would appear that ALA played some role, uh, knowingly or not, you know, however he yeah. was being used. So uh, I just thought, role. you know, Arthur Leal did pass a polygraph when he was at a ta at Tascadero. And, uh, you know, he could have been on, you know, I even suggested one time maybe they were on tranquilizers at a Tascadero. What a stretch. And yeah. that might have helped him. Uh, yeah, for sure. You know, of course, Cheney took a polygraph and it was inconclusive. The first he one was he, he showed up on over drunk. the day before. Yeah. Yeah. So he's hiding something. OK, we yeah. all agree that Cheney's hiding yeah. something. Yeah. Even George Bauer said that he goes, I think John Cheney knows more than he's letting on. For well, sure. What is that? The fact that he's just trying to to uh, to uh, frame his friend for being the Zodiac. And think about this. And I've never even made this comment before. So this is good. This is exclusive to your show, man. Um so Cheney comes forward in 71 and, you know, so the, the, the crimes are already, you know, they're a little old, but they're not, you know, that ancient yet. And he's going to accuse his friend, Arthur Lee Allen, who's a child, known child molester, you know, a creepy guy that no one likes, uh, is being the Zodiac, now taking credit for the Zodiac's work, all the ciphers, all the letters. Don't you think Don would be a little scared that this, uh, this killer named the Zodiac is going to find out that you're now... You're pushing forward your friend who the Zodiac knows is an Arthur Lee Allen. He could get a little upset by that, that this masterwork he created is now getting uh, assigned to Arthur Lee Allen. Of course, at the time, the Zodiac would have had to have, you know, inside information and know that was the suspect. But it couldn't have been. I mean, they always have. think that the Zodiac already had inside information. So yeah, I, I, a risk I, I, to take if you're Don Cheney. I'm starting to think that, like, he did. Like, I think I think there's more of a case for, like, that he did have inside information that he didn't. I know uh, Tom uh, made the comment that, uh, oh, one thing about Avery quick, didn't he have, like, an oxy oxygen machine? I guess that would have been for, like, the, uh, later, the later. Later on he did. He died from emphysema. 
Yeah. Uh, man, he was, he was a heavy, heavy smoker, even in college. His college yeah. buddy told me that. Uh, he said, man, even in college, a guy never, you never see him without a cigarette. I mean, he was a, he was a heavy, heavy smoker. Uh, yeah. which kind of would make it hard to do, you know, various if it was Avery. Some of that um, Zodiac stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I, I don't really like him. And then, uh, Tom was saying that like Tashi and everybody, Avery, Gray Smith, they all used to chill at that one, um, uh, restaurant bar. I forget the name of it, but it was the famous place down there. And he easily said like Zodiac could have easily walked in here. If no one knew what he looked like, he could have easily posted up behind these guys at the bar and grabbed a beer and probably heard of some of the stuff they were talking about. That's so a good point. Yeah, that's so, a good point. You know, think about it. A guy as smart as we know the Zodiac is now, disguise. Um, he could have easily found out that Allen was what they who they were kicking around. Mm -hmm. So if you're Don Cheney, aren't you taking a risk there that this guy's going to be like so. pissed at you? Yeah, you know, yeah. you're my masterwork, and now you're saying this guy did it. This this uh, this horrible like goofball is taking credit for my masterpiece. I mean, and then be a target, and then think of what Cheney did. Think about it. If you don't believe that it's Arthur Allen, most people don't. I mean, most people really into that don't really think Arthur Allen was a killer. People that really dig in don't think that. You know, there's a lot of reasons, not just because left-handed, right-handed didn't really match the sketch. But think about it. When Don no. Cheney, Cheney comes forward, he forever changes the course of this case. I mean, if, if, if it's just Allen and Cheney jerking the police around or a revenge deal against Allen and they're not the Zodiac, think about it. You forever change the trajectory of the way it was going. That right, led right. to Ray Smith's book. That led to the Fincher film. He, yeah, John yeah. Cheney, forever changed this case on his own. His yeah, own. Yeah. When he decided to come forward and have his buddy call the police and uh, say, uh, "Hey, my friend told me all this weird stuff back in New Year's Day '69." Of course, this is July '71. Why did he wait so long? Well, we already went through that. But think about yeah, it. Yeah. He totally changed the trajectory of this case. Don yeah. Cheney did. You don't. Without Don Cheney, you don't have a Fincher film. You don't have a Ray Smith book. Don Cheney forever changed this case, even if he's not the Zodiac. And why did he do it? There's the question. Yeah, he's the main catalyst. And also, the Zodiac's big on his credit because he's making them publish three ciphers. He's yep. writing a letter that he's taken credit for basically every murder, you know, close to it, you know, however long he waits, two, three days, whatever. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't see Z, like, just letting some guy come out like, oh, it's definitely my friend because he has the watch and, mm -hmm. uh, like, what about these codes? What about like the Mikado, Berryessa, all these other references? It's like, yeah, yeah I, I, did, I did all this to get it cleaned on Arthur Lee Allen. <laughs> yeah. A guy who's like a, like out of work janitor, like, like part-time, whatever he was teacher, like it just doesn't, doesn't seem good. Yeah. Uh, well, who, who insert, who inserted himself into this case after the fact, what man inserted himself that wanted to be on the front lines of this case, like some serial killers do. Mm, yeah, Don, for sure. I mean, Don did. I, I still kind of think that it's an unknown person, but if it was someone like that, like inserted themselves in the case, then it was done because it, it, no one that's else like, did. No what, one else yeah, inserted like, themselves to that level. Now you can say Don Harden did when he saw the uh, the four hundred eight, but um, yeah. but you know to a, that wasn't really like when when Harden willingly. did that. When Harden broke that cipher, he even told his students he was a teacher at Salinas. And yeah. he said, you know what? I'm going to tell you everything that it did because everybody's curious about it. Here's what I did. Uh, yeah. But this is going to be it. I'm going to tell you about it once. I don't want it ever brought up again in this classroom. Does that sound like a guy that was all for the glory and credit? He literally told, that's true. He exactly. told students, here's what happened. I know you're curious. Don't ever bring it up again. That's yeah. not the Zodiac. The Zodiac yeah. is a no. guy that's not going to give it up. Ego. And, <laughs> and like I said, if the Zodiac's unknown and it's not done, Yes, I mean, he's got to have all of Don's qualifications. Yeah. I mean, even when Gareth Penn said the average populace that would have known what a radian was, even back then, would have been one out of 100. Just yeah. starting with that. I mean, sure, people say, oh, I had it in calculus in high school. But I think uh, Michael Cole yeah. makes a great argument for that. Even if you had calculus in high school and somewhat went over radians, who's going to really know what it is 20 years later if you're not doing it for your vocation? Yeah. Not yeah. hardly anyone. One out yeah. of 100. Would have had a light table, would have known what a radian was, and every other attribute that John Cheney had. Drafting skills that you could draft with freehand, because, of course, the Zodiac's hiding his handwriting. He's doing these neatly yeah. printed ciphers. He can draft. Don could yeah. draft. And yeah. Don matched the physical descriptions. He was barrel-chested. So yes. the unknown suspect's got a lot of catching up to do to get up to Don. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this is why I brought you on, because, like I said, you have a ridiculously uh, convincing uh, – case that you have made um one thing that you brought up on the zodcast was the the santa rosa uh killings and that i believe that was somewhat in close proximity to where AL, ala lived 
as the point that you made on the Zodcast, I would love to have his DNA reference against those Santa Rosa killings because or what they were they were hitchhikers, I think that that were murdered up yeah, there. Hitchhikers, uh, yeah. Young, so, young, young female sexually assaulted. So you're yeah. already getting off of the Zodiac track right there. Right. Gray Smith's the one to try to tie the Zodiac into the, the Santa Rosa murders with yeah. uh, he, he threw uh, Zodiac that Unmasked. Yeah, yeah, I haven't read Unmasked yet, but uh, I would love to see that one because if that doesn't match ALA, I think that's a good case for them. Like, I don't think he probably did. Like, I don't think he probably did it, any of them. You know what I mean? Right. Why? Why wouldn't else. they? Though? They have they have Arthur Allen's DNA. Yeah, and they have DNA from those attacks because they were sexual assaults. Yeah, that's yeah. Why they caught Golden State because he was raping people. They had a lot of his DNA. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. And I think they have Kim Allen. You know, just the same last name. Uh, I think they have Kim Allen's DNA, who's one of the more known uh, Santa Rosa hitchhiker victims. Yep. And uh, they're not related, by the way. <laughs> but uh, I actually ran that down. But uh, why yeah, wouldn't yeah. they do that? To at least rule them out. Say, yeah, we got Allen's. I know DNA testing is expensive, but, you know, they can afford it. But, I mean, for someone, they have his brain, right? So for someone you think, like, exactly. is the leading Zodiac suspect, you think you'd want to at least rule these other things Yeah, out. because Allen did have a trailer in Santa Rosa, and the, and the trailer was ground zero around where a lot of those – uh, females were going missing, but if you look at Alan's profile, uh, you know he he was inappropriate inappropriately touching some of the female students when he was at Valley Springs. That's why he got fired. But his preference was boys. It right. really was. Now when he because he got arrested for for uh, molesting boys, but if you read the police reports, these boys were like kind of like they weren't really runaways, but they weren't really being watched by their families much. They were kind of yeah. like into drugs, alcohol, and Alan would buy them drugs and alcohol and kind of coerce them into these sex acts. And yeah. Alan never, ever threatened to kill any of those boys. Never said, yeah. if you tell, I'm going to kill you. Nothing yeah. like that. He simply just said, don't tell. It was almost like he was just, you know, nonchalant. And that's in the police reports. He never said, you tell, I'll kill you. Never. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it really points away from the Zodiac. Yeah, I agree. I, t I totally agree with that. Uh, was it uh, Cheney and Alan that had the, the – the fight, the fake fight, when they said it was, I don't know if that's related to the thing of, uh, there was the story that Alan, I think you already uh, debunked this on the Zodcast, but that Alan supposedly touched uh, Cheney's, what was it, his daughter in an inappropriate yeah, his way? Daughter, yeah, the, the, the story story was, and that, that is, it is interesting in one aspect. You know, the, so the story is, and that's how people somewhat, when they can't really figure Cheney out, they say, well, that's Cheney's motivation for, for revenge on Arthur yeah, Allen, because yeah, Cheney yeah. claimed in 1967, and he's fairly specific about the year that they were on a boating trip, and uh, Arthur Allen touched Cheney's daughter's bottom. I mean, it wasn't this full on molestation. He touched her bottom with his hand, something like that, you know, so it wasn't this full blown deal, you know, yeah. you know, uh, but, you know, I guess bad enough. And, uh, you know, but the first thing that's weird about that is Cheney's daughter in 1967, because I know when she was born, of course, she would have been maximum three years old. And yeah. I had no history of going after anyone that young, number one. Right. Uh, number two, as an adult, uh, his daughter told Tom Voigt that it never happened. She never heard of it. Her mother never told her about it. That's kind of right. odd because it wasn't so horrific that you wanted to hide it from her. And she's going to find out, right? So right. Uh, she claimed it never happened. So it's really weird. But one thing that's really, really strange is that at the at some point after 1967, Don Cheney did tell Ron and Karen Allen that that event did happen. So that's strange to me because it's almost like Don is already setting up his his uh, his plan to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And this is going to tie in later. And that's one of those things. It's like Alan like a, knowing like the alibi question. Kind of yeah, because yeah. first, you know, the daughter claims never happened, and then second of all, Cheney never called the police about it. And what else? Cheney's going to wait till 1971 to exact his revenge for something that happened yeah. in 1967? Yeah. yeah, come on. Whoa, man, that's crazy. And think about that. That's as crazy as a Zodiac killer. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm mad at my friend for touching my daughter's bottom in 1967. So in summer of 71, I'm going to pin the most notorious serial killings on him for it. That's yeah. as bizarre as the Zodiac itself. And he's Which not even going to lie. Right. And, he, and not only am I going to pin it on him, he's never going to go down for it. He's like, he's not going to get arrested. He's not going to get in right. any trouble. And if they do found evidence, find real evidence, some of it might incriminate like me. So it's never going to go that far. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, that's Don didn't <laughs> want Arthur Leon to go down all the way for a lot of reasons. One, probably because he didn't do it and maybe still liked him on some levels. That's another thing I forgot to mention. Don, right. by his own admission, after that uh, event with the daughter that he claimed, stayed friends with him. 
Yeah, that's he just, that's. I just quit bringing my kids that, around. Him. That, we stayed friends for a, a. He said six months to a year and a half. Bye. That would never happen. That would never happen. He's so mad he's going to stay friends with him. Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> that would ne never happen. It like, never happened. I mean, it shows you it's all a lie. But the interesting part is, is he did tell Ron and Karen Allen early yes, about it. Yes, so yes. that tells you he's planning. He's planning so, this. He's there's planning this, this from the beginning. There's this big internet story that was debunked. Isn't that when supposedly uh, Cheney uh, – doesn't uh, Allen have a fight with someone? Is it Cheney or it's someone? Elliot. Yeah. So – and th and that – Likely never happened either, right? Like there was well, this. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's cloudy. Fun. It's yeah. cloudy because at the beginning of his name is Arthur Lee Allen. The video it starts off with an interview with Ralph Spinelli, and he's talking about this time in high school where he was dancing with this girl, and it was somebody else's girlfriend. And he goes back home that night. He's still living at home, and a guy shows up to his door. You know, he's like living in a, a, a little place, like in the back, like an apartment built onto his house where his parents still live or whatever. And this guy comes in and he's and they get in a physical fight because yeah. Spinelli was dancing with the guy's girlfriend. And yeah. it's weird because when I first heard it, I extrapolated that to be Arthur Lee Allen, but it wasn't. It was another guy who was, yeah. the, I guess, the boyfriend of the girl Spinelli was dancing with. And then he says, and then all of a sudden, after we, these two, you know, Spinelli's fighting with this other guy, Arthur Lee Allen shows up at the door and he says the door just explodes. Yeah, he kicks the door open. That's the yeah, one. The That's door just explodes and this big man enters. And he, and yeah. and then he ends it right there. He doesn't say he gets in this huge fight with Allen or anything. It's, yeah, yeah. it's a bizarre story. And yeah. it does look like there is a police report from hmm. that incident. But what I'm thinking is the incident is with... Uh, I don't know, maybe the first guy, because it's just so strange. It, that, that whole story yeah. makes no sense. Yeah, I remember uh, there was some fight about Alan getting it with someone, but there's obviously yeah, Spinelli, so much. It's, it's Ross it's such yeah, a it's weird like story. Keeping, yeah, that was a that was a weird one. Well, uh, uh, if anybody else has any questions for Drew, let us know. I was thinking about maybe switching gears to DB Cooper real quick, unless you have anything else on. Uh, yeah, man, so, yeah. that, that's it. Uh, you know the case well, man. I like that. I, lo I like it when people it's pick it up and know it as well as you do. Yeah. Uh, it's great to hear that because you know it pretty well. No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm pretty. Ca I've gone in and out over the years. Like I remember when I saw Zodiac, and then I've always like gone in and out. And then these last like six months, I uh, got super deep and went down with uh, Brian. He's a gunner from the Zodiac Killer Forum. Uh, we have an extremely long discussion, uh, which oh, was my. Yeah, I've seen his post. He, he, he's yeah. a smart guy. He knows it pretty yeah. well. He, he knows military history, and you know he's a Navy Navy gunner. So yeah, we went down to uh, the where uh, the uh, hotel, which was the old hotel with. Uh, Johnny Ray, the swindles, and uh, we did a whole breakdown of that, which will be dropping on YouTube soon. So uh, no, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I, I'd love yeah. to see that. Yeah, yeah, I want to go up and do uh, Ray Davis up in Oceanside for the next one too, and then I might yeah, try to go. Up. That lady, that, that lady, I, I've caught. Have you ever? Yeah, the lady Christy, that wrote the article? Christy she's very nice. Yeah. She's very yeah. nice, and anything you need from her, she's very uh, open with it, and she knows Ray, the Ray Davis. She's the one that brought it out. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to. I definitely like to get an uh, interview with her. And then I, now, I, I believe they did recover some DNA from uh, Davis's his cab. So I guess that was one thing that they were trying to yeah, reopen I, I, or look into. So I'm not sure if they did or not. I don't remember hearing that. Somebody else told me that the, that the killer of Ray Davis drove off at the cab. I didn't remember that. Have you heard that? I don't, I don't think I don't he drove know if off. True or not? I said, man, I don't know about that. I never heard that. That that would be a cool one. I don't think he drove off with the cab. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think he drove off with the cat. But as you were saying, he did uh, threaten uh, school children, which is similar to after Paul Stott. You know, the whole, what we were talking about earlier, the bomb, the bomb drawing and the bomb threat. Um, so that similar kind of event played out in Oceanside where they were, I think, putting some police on school buses and taking those same kind of precautions that the Bay took uh, during those. So, I mean, it was, you know, like freaking lone, lone cabbie back of the head and then, you know, similar school. And a phone school call. Children, and a phone right? call. So, yeah, and phone call near uh, also nearby military bases, which is a you know common thing of the, the Bay Area and the, and this Southern California uh, San Diego stuff. So anyway, yeah, uh, man, the, this just this case is like it's old, but I mean at the same time it it never ends. It just constantly yeah, well, goes. There's too much of a fascination with it. Yeah, I agree, and that's uh, why I'm a big fan of Drew's uh, channel. So definitely subscribe to him there and check out the Zodcast. Check out his book. Citing it on the Zodiac Killer. Oh yeah, if you want to just before we get into DB Cooper, if you want to break down um some of your other books and other projects that you've done, um you can just maybe name them and let people know to grab them on Amazon or whatever. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, there's a uh, I have a website. It's called DrewBeasonBooks.com. They're all on there. Uh, cool. The most recent book is about the Yuba County Five disappearance. 
that happened in Yuba County, uh, Yuba County, California, where uh, five guys just went missing in 1978. Uh, fascinating story I got into, and I uh, wrote a book about them that's out now, and it's it's uh, doing pretty well. Fascinating case. I don't try to solve it uh, in the book, you know, I, you know, as I do try with the Zodiac and D.B. Cooper, because I think I know who they are. But with Yuba County Five, I didn't. I just wanted to know what the families believed, and I got access to three of the five families. Uh, which was, was unprecedented. I was so lucky to get a hold of these people. So uh, if any, if you like missing person stories, that one is fascinating. It's called the American D Outlaw Pass, you know, like the Russian incident, because it's similar to that incident in a lot of ways. But it's called uh, Out of Bounds, uh, Disappearance of the Yuba County Five. What happened awesome. to awesome. Yuba County Five is the subtitle. Yep. And you've got your, your TV Cooper one. And I, I think you have some other fiction up there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Some smaller fiction. I kind of started with that and I got into you know, the classics that I always love, you know, Zodiac and D.B. Cooper, of yeah. course. Yeah, hell yeah. So, yeah, I just watched the, uh, I, uh, as I said, I'm a casual D.B. Cooper he head because it's just, like, it's awesome just to, like, read about that stuff because it's so, like, insane. I, I'm definitely more obsessed with, with Zodiac, but D.B. Cooper is probably the second most interesting case in American history. So I just watched the, uh, the what's that, Brad Meltzer's uh, Decoded, and they yeah. were pushing the uh, the Kenny Christensen, Kenny Christensen yeah. stuff there. I'm I'm sure you've encountered him. He's uh you know was an employee. Apparently had like 200k show up. I figured we just break down a couple suspects and then you oh, can. Oh yeah, kind of, I know him well. I know him well. Yeah, <laughs> I, know him all. I, I believe you actually. Start with Kenny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I so I watched you. I watched your three episodes, uh, the dr the drop on DB Cooper. So check those out on on Drew's channel. This uh, this guy goes in deep. So yeah, we got Kenny. He's a like a disgruntled employee, possibly r writing some letters back to his family about the the strikes and not happy with with payment and stuff. I, it, he he does have some some military history, but I don't, I don't think he's like a very super little, expert very jumper. He, he yeah. trained as a paratrooper. Kenny Christensen trained as a paratrooper. Uh, for World War One, he was going to be shipped out to the Pacific, but the war ended before Kenny. Uh, I mean, bef the war ended uh, before Kenny was ever, you know, saw any action. We'll put it that way. But he did have some training uh, for World War Two in paratrooping, uh, which is which is my biggest beef against Kenny Christensen because. Uh, uh, he did, you know, uh, for that you do static, what they call static line training, where you literally hook on to the to the wire. It opens up your parachute for you. You're low right. to the ground. It's really for, uh, 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 you know, a, a sack of flour could, could do a static line jump, literally. <laughs> yeah. uh, it could. You could just push a sack of flour out on a static line and the parachute's going to open for you. Right. The static right. line pulls, you know, open it to point your parachute. Yeah. You didn't even pull the ripcord. Right, so right. that's, to my knowledge, and no one's ever proved me different, uh, I've never seen where Kenny Christensen did anything more than static line training. And he even wrote a letter back home to his parents about how he hated it. He hated <laughs> the static line yeah. jumping. So I don't think that's good. Years later, years later in 1971, he's going to learn how to jump out of a Boeing 727 into terrible weather from yeah. hating static line baby yeah. jumping, <laughs> hating it, to jumping out of a Boeing 727 into bad weather. That's a massive leap. That's a yeah. massive leap of uh, training to go in between there. Yet there's not one incidence of that anyone can prove, uh, including uh, Mr. Blevins, who, who's the the expert on him. And he's a nice guy, yeah. but I'm sorry, there's nothing to yeah. even show that uh, Kenny Christensen ever had a free fall. Are you kidding yeah. me? And then he's going to jump out of a 727? It's yeah. pathetic. Um, yeah. Some circumstantial stuff is there. Yes, uh, Kenny Christensen worked for Northwest Orient Airline as a purser, which is kind of like a Mel Suris, I guess. I don't know, but he did international stuff. And one thing weird about Kenny is he had a friend named Bernie Geestman. I think it's G E S T M A N. Uh, really, kind of a weird guy. You know, it's kind of like a Cheney and a and a Allen uh, friendship going on here. It's similar. You know, it really one. is. And. Uh, <laughs> And it, so those guys probably were up to something. I just don't know what. But I don't yeah. think it was jumping out of a 727. Now, Giesman was a mechanic at Northwest Orient, so he knew the 727 a little bit. Right. You know, or, you know, as far as mechanically. But the thing is about D.B. Cooper, no one knew you could jump out of the aft stair. And they really didn't know that the plane could take off with the aft stair down. Because right. that particular right. model, 727, had what they called an aft stair, which would lower – uh, where people could get on and off that way. And no one knew that the plane could even take off with that stare down. The only people that knew that were the covert ops in Vietnam because yeah, they were yeah, doing yeah. that with Air America. And it was extremely classified that it could even be done. 
the pilots of D.B. Cooper's plane didn't even know it could take off with the Astor down. And Cooper had an argument with the pilot over it. And eventually, because the pilots were like, no way, are you crazy? It can't even be done. And uh, the pilots, honestly, Cooper knew the plane better than the pilots did. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the things you, you, you learn about when you dig into this case. But, you know, going back to Kenny Christensen, um, you know, he's just not a good suspect because he just doesn't have the training to jump out of a 727 from static line World War II training that happened, what, 35 years before the Cooper yeah. skyjacking? He, he just doesn't have it. Yeah, he's a for sure. <laughs> well, uh, he kind of gets that mystery money out of nowhere. Do you have anything? Yeah, the mystery money has been picked apart over the years. Okay. Um, you know, he had a house he bought. He bought uh, some lady some expensive item for the kitchen. I don't remember what, but, uh, you know, he, he did have a deed on the house, which they said he didn't at the time that he paid cash. Uh, you know, a lot of that has been picked apart. Uh, but, but after you pick it apart, it's not near as strong. And, you know, what he is left with is some money, you know, but nothing sub that substantial. He had a coin collection and some stuff like that. So it looked like he was getting some money from another source. Yeah. Maybe him and Geisman were running drugs or something else, but there's no way Kenny Christensen can jump from a 727 uh, unless he was going to take skydiving lessons off the record, and he sure didn't know how to jump out of a 727, which is a whole new ball game. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know about that one. I mean, I, I don't think Dan Cooper hated jumping. I think he loved jumping, and I think that guy had brass balls. I think he jumped all the time, like Absolutely you said. Absolutely, he did a crap ton of, of jump flight oh, hours. He did. He did. You, did, you did get a question. Uh, I'm sure you covered this in your book, uh, going back to Zodiac real quick, Andrew Gray. Wasn't Don Cheney over six uh, over six foot five? Not not that tall, I don't believe. No, absolutely not. Don Cheney was 5'11". Yeah. 5'11 and stocky barrel chested. And when they asked Cecilia, Cecilia Shepard at Lake Berryessa um, how tall he was, uh, she said about, uh, you know, to the to the officer there, he said, I'm standing here and I'm um, 5'10". And she said he was about an inch or two taller than you, putting uh -huh. him right 5'11", 6 feet. Don Cheney was right at about 5'11", uh, so obviously stocky. Um, six five, Ross Sullivan was 6'3". No, no, sorry. Ross Sullivan was 6'2", 300 pounds. I don't remember anybody being that tall at all. Of course, Brian Hartnell was 6'7". Yeah, uh, he's a victim. So I don't remember any suspect being that tall. But Don, no, Don was about five eleven. Yeah, I don't know if it was Facebook or Reddit. I've I've heard some of your commentary on those those forums, which is amazing, by the way. And uh, someone tried to hit me with the well, it was Brian Hartnell recently, and I'm like, was the killer? Yeah. Are you <laughs> yeah. Like, well, so you a guy yeah, walked out pretty quick because uh, Cecilia was still alive for two days and never said it was him. It was him. Brian almost died. <laughs> he, he was like, he, they found him like he's he like like crawled his way and they found him like bleeding on the path. Like he he, he almost and died. Probably Land picked him up. Yes. Yeah. If they didn't find him, he probably would have died. So whatever people do, like, oh yeah, it was definitely hard now. I'm like. Dude, you're driving me crazy. Then you but, uh, had Cecilia in, 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 you know, brainwashed pretty well because she was yeah. still making, uh, you know, good statements about the height, about the weight. I mean, obviously yeah. she had been stabbed uh, fatally, but she was yeah. still able to give a lot of good descriptions. And she even said she saw the hair coming through the eyelets, which was brown, which corroborated Brian saying the same thing separately. Yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, just so uh, you're welcome for that one, Andrew. You guys should keep the questions coming if you like. We're yeah, just going to go back coming. to – db cooper I just because uh, back and forth on these drew, two keeps me nimble drew, drew, drew knows his knows his stuff seriously on both these cases uh so i watched a video recently on youtube and they they put a nice tight bow on rack straw and, and they really they really tightened that one nice and clean for me so thank you internet <laughs> case closed but i think you covered it in your drop on db cooper trilogy uh you know rack straw was the cia agent and they 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 linked all the letters back to his old platoons and, and the CIA was covering for him. So feel free to oh, debunk. Poppycock. Right. Poppycock. <laughs> Rack straw is terrible. <laughs> yeah, Rack straw is terrible. Uh, you know, Rack straw was looked at, looked at as Cooper fairly early on. He was ruled out by the FBI. Uh, yeah. He had been a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. Pretty good helicopter pilot, by the way, in Vietnam. Um, yeah. Vietnam is where you'd learn how to jump a 727. For yeah, sure. Yeah. So he had that going for him. Uh, one thing he didn't have going for him uh, was his age. He was 28 years old at the time of the of the Cooper skyjacking. Everybody that saw Cooper that would That's make 40. a good statement about it said he was middle age, about 40, yeah. 
44, 45 years old. Yeah. And with Robert Rackstraw, he did not look uh, old for his age. Now, Richard Floyd McCoy did, but not Robert mm -hmm. Rackstraw. And mm -hmm. Rackstraw went to, I think he took some family members to like Disneyland like the month before the Cooper skyjacking. So there's a good photo of Rackstraw taken just a month before the skyjacking. Mm -hmm. He looks every bit of 28 years old. First yeah. thing that really hurts him, he doesn't look middle age. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you get into the codes, that was just, uh, you know, Thomas Colbert is the newspaper, you know, a newspaper guy, a news reporter who did the whole Rackstraw deal because he heard this story. And this is really kind of fascinating. And he actually had me when, when he came out with this and he was going to, you know, he wrote the book called The Last Master Outlaw. It's about Robert Rackstraw being D.B. Cooper. I was excited. I thought this guy had figured it out. So that showed you where I was at the time. And that was five years ago, something like that. Yeah, yeah, so then yeah. he does the, the TV special based on that. Uh, it was called D.B. Cooper Case Closed. And that's based on his book. And I, I remember when that show was coming on, I was so excited. I thought this guy's going to solve it. Uh, yeah. And, I, you know, I, was, I didn't have any other suspect. I kind of liked uh, Wolfgang Gossett a little bit at the time, but I wasn't sold on it. But this Rackstraw guy sounded interesting, man. I want to know about him. And then, you know, at the conclusion of the, of the TV show, He's partnered with, uh, I think Billy Jensen was the newspaper. Uh, he's a crime writer. He's still around. And, uh, you know, he was going to kind of vet these claims from uh, Thomas Colbert and his team of 30 uh, detective sleuths. That have yeah, they put a bunch of money into the uh, Yeah, and I watched that show again like six months ago. And at the end, Billy Jensen and even the guy that was working with Thomas Colbert kind of said, yeah, we've looked at everything about Rackstraw and we just don't agree with you. I mean, so they <laughs> even kind of left him empty handed at the end. You know, you feel sorry for Colbert at the end of that documentary, his own All documentary. That money. <laughs> you feel sorry for him. Yeah, he spent yeah. so much time trying to break Cooper. There's not a lot of money in Cooper, man. Let's just be honest. There isn't. It's not near as popular as Zodiac. You're not going to get rich writing indie books, by the way. Well, There's I just mean the money they poured into like. You're trying to make money writing books. You've never yeah. written a book. Okay. If you sell a lot, you're not going to quit your day yeah. job. We'll just put that yeah. out there before anyone says that. But anyway, you do. <laughs> You, especially D.B. Cooper, because it's cool, and D.B. Cooper was cool, but you don't make a lot of money on Cooper unless you're the Adventure yeah. Kids guy. Uh, yeah. He's doing well with it. Uh, but anyway, with Rackstraw, I think the, the whole deal with the codes being in the letters came yeah. after the the TV show and because mm -hmm. he was such a failure, and he needed more. So he yeah. finds this guy. His name was Rick Sherwood. See, I know this case well. Yeah. And Rick Sherwood says, yeah, I was in Vietnam. Um, but I didn't know Rackstraw, and I don't even think he, Rackstraw was in one of his units. Almost. And uh, he uh, comes up with this whole theory about Rackstraw's units being embedded in the letters, and there's D.B. Cooper, what we call letter number five and six. And if you read those two letters, uh, front to finish, they have nothing in common, zero. This whole code thing that Rick Sherwood came up with is absolute nonsense. Anyone really looking at it, you can get Daffy Duck out of those letters. You can get <laughs> Gary Coleman, as I like to joke about, out of those letters. It was really a desperation and a money play yeah, yeah. to even get Sherwood to do that. So Rackstraw is just weak. He was a he was kind of a, a really he was a loose cannon. He was very yeah. violent. Yeah. Um, the guy yeah, he was, was locked up in the uh, in the in the brigade there, and he was like, he was like, he said something like, "Oh, don't worry, like I know I'm gonna get out of this or something." So people, you know, thought his inside connections were just gonna let him off, and it was like, yeah, "That's my guy." Um, <laughs> yeah, but that, but that, you know, no one was protecting Rackstraw because he didn't have, you know, they, he said they kicked him out of the military. Yeah, he's like a loose because, cannon. Like, he lied about his education. He got kicked out of the army, which they claim that's what his motivation was to be Cooper. Right. But, uh, obviously, he wasn't being protected by the FBI or the CIA because he got thrown out of the military yeah. uh, for lying. Yeah. And he's a very like violent this. guy. He, he beat a guy senseless that owed him a little money. He was a commercial yeah. flooring guy. So obviously, if he was Cooper, he didn't get away with the money because he was like uh, putting floors together a year yeah, later. He quit his day job. Like, yeah. So uh, he, he, he he's weak in a lot of ways. I just liked his jumping uh, experience because it, it seemed like he had, you know, he had the jumps. But again, he, he I'm a total. Really, you know, uh, Rackstar really wasn't much of a jumper. He was a helicopter pilot, but he probably had some jump training, but not heavy. He wasn't, right. you know, he wasn't airborne. He was, a, he was a helicopter pilot. For sure. And then I, I know uh, Drew's got to go soon, guys, so we'll wrap quickly. Uh, and then your man Richard McCoy does a copycat uh, heist uh, shortly after D.B. Cooper. He epically fails and they catch him a short time later. I don't think Richard McCoy was, was Dan Cooper. <laughs> he, he failed really bad on his copycat. Well, things. you know, actually he didn't. He actually got away with it. But, uh, but, but if, they you got him. The if, you, if you look at the details of what McCoy did, of course, McCoy did it second. Uh, yeah. He did it about five months later after Cooper. Cooper came up with the idea. Cooper came up with the idea to do it in the first place. 
Hoover right. came up with the idea of a briefcase bomb, which was very intelligent. It's a game changer to do that. McCoy yeah. didn't. McCoy used a, uh, a dummy hand grenade, a pistol with one yeah. bullet. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was totally different. McCoy actually left the hijack instructions that were typed up by his wife yeah. in the airport when he got on the plane. So the guy noticed the envelope in the lobby and brought it on the plane saying, did someone leave this behind? <laughs> McCoy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Comes out, McCoy comes out of the bathroom after putting on his makeup yeah. and uh, says, that's mine, that's mine. Yeah. If the guy only had looked at that, that gig would have been up right then and there. So yeah. the guy is not astute like D.B. Cooper was. D.B. Cooper asked for the notes back. Yeah, yeah, he didn't make any back. mistakes whatsoever. Cooper made no mistakes. McCoy was a nervous wreck. His makeup was running. There was an inmate Jeez. being transferred at the time sitting near him, and they looked at him like, I know you're about to do something right. And the guy, McCoy's <laughs> like, McCoy showed him the gun like, shut up, dude. I mean, he drew attention to himself. Yeah. Uh, McCoy actually brought his own parachute on, which a lot of people don't remember. And the, oh. and the, and the par- it was just that's actually kind of smart because he was afraid yeah. the ones they would bring him would be uh, – have yeah. a, a tracker on it. So yeah. um, he, uh, the mis- in the mis- parachute he brought on, d- deployed in the plane. I mean, it was a disaster, but he got <laughs> away with it. And That's he amazing. dragged everybody. He, he told yeah. a, a friend of his, it was Utah National Guard, uh, yeah. or no, actually Utah State Police said he was going to do it. Now Cooper should have asked for half a million instead of 200. Yeah. So McCoy was a wreck. Looked nothing like the sketch. McCoy had, a lot of people don't know this, Richard McCoy had a lisp. That little piece of skin that attaches your tongue to the bottom of your mouth, he was missing that. Ah, I saw that. He had a lisp. I saw uh, that. He sat next to Tina Mucklow for all that time, never reported D.B. Cooper had a lisp. Uh, There's a lot of things that point against McCoy. Uh, Your man, Bat Falcon, asked you, did Rackstraw jump out of 727s? I mean, I don't don't really think... No, yeah. and Robert Rackstraw was not in Special Forces. Despite what Thomas Colbert will tell you, he was never in Special Forces. Now, Richard Floyd McCoy was briefly in Special Forces for about six months in 1965 over Vietnam. I know that I've seen his record, but a uh, very short assignment. He was technically a Green Beret, but he was not, uh, you know, he did, McCoy, I think, did three tours in Vietnam. Or I know he did two, and he was trying to go back for a third because he was having a lot of money trouble. And that's what motivated him. But uh, he, McCoy was a Green Beret. Rack Straw was not. Rack Straw had, he had some Special Forces training, but he was never a member of Special Forces. Um, so do you want to drop the title of your D.B. Cooper book? I believe it's out. And uh, anything you want on your suspect or whatever people can learn from your D.B. Cooper research? Yeah, sure. The Viper Cooper book's called uh, Paratrooper of Fortune. Uh it's about a guy named Ted B. Braden. It's got CIA, you know, had CIA ties, uh, uh-huh. uh, fought in the Congo. Uh, he fought as a mercenary. He, he went AWOL from Vietnam. He was in special forces. He was elite special forces. He was a member of what they call MACV SOG. SOG uh-huh. stands for Studies and Observations Group. And that was a very benign name for the black ops in Vietnam. The guys that did the wiretaps in Laos, they did... Uh, prisoner uh, snatches in Laos. I mean, you're talking about dangerous stuff. Most yeah, those guys yeah. had a casualty rate of 100%. To get into this group, you had to be the best of the best, the best of special forces. I mean, they were the most elite. And, and Braden was a team leader of uh, Team Colorado. They called him the 1-0 team leader. And they would do just crazy stuff. They would get dropped off by helicopter, parachute into Laos. When Ted Braden went into Vietnam, he loved it because he was such an advanced skydiver. He loved to pull under a thousand feet, which is suicide for most people. Braden did it in Vietnam because there was so there was almost no rules. And when you were in special forces, you weren't, you know, really answering to many above you because you were doing such covert stuff. And Braden had, I mean, he had, I think, seven hundred ninety-five free falls logged. I mean, that kind of beat Kenny Christensen a little bit, maybe. And uh, Braden would have absolutely known you could jump a 727 because he was elite special forces. He would have known it all day long. He could have done it easily. This guy had no fear of death. He had no fear of apprehension. And I bring out in the book how he had a good relationship with a General John Singlob, who was a uh, predecessor to special forces in the OSS during World War II. He knew him in the early 1960s when Ted Braden was a member of the Golden Arrows Parachute. A competition team which he won most of those that's how good of a skydiver this guy was just yes, the best yeah. but he was friends with john singlob who later became the chief of that special forces unit in 1966 brayden left at the end of 66 he went awol from vietnam and went to fight as a mercenary because he wanted more money just like db cooper but this guy has all the background he's very secretive
he could have done the Cooper jump, drunk, blindfolded, kicked out. <laughs> and he had no fear of what was going to happen because he had all the dirt on these people. He had dirt internationally on the CIA because he was wow. doing covert stuff in Laos. He knew all the secrets in Laos. He yep. knew all the secrets globally that they were doing. Why they didn't just kill him, I don't know. Maybe Singh was protecting him or they were scared he was going to put something in the mail they were afraid of. He's the guy, the only guy that if any ever known Cooper suspect that the FBI would have covered up for because they're afraid of what he knew. And of course he's dead. He died, uh, when did Brayden die? I think 97. And, uh, and uh, that, 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 that's it. No, sorry, 2007. I'm, Cheney died in 2009, so Brayden 2007. And uh, that's a guy they didn't want talking. Um, I'm sure you covered his fate in your book, but uh, did he go, did he disappear? Or did he just go low key after, he, after the Cooper incidents? He, he went really low key. Um, I, you know, I talked to one of his stepdaughters who was, uh, he was living with at the time. And the craziest thing about that is his own stepdaughters did not know he had two biological children. So I'm telling you, this guy could keep a secret. If he was Cooper, <laughs> you wouldn't know it. Uh, his, his, uh, one of his best friends is jumping partner, Al Tire, who, who heavily contributed towards the book. Uh, which was a big help to me because he, you know, he he jumped with Braden. He said, yeah. "I had no idea he had biological children." I said, "Yep, he does." Oh, and he couldn't yeah. believe it. I mean, the guy could just keep a secret. I mean, he was very secretive, heavy, deep CIA ties. His stepdaughter said, "You know, he was a truck driver. He was a truck driver in the early '70s, even after the jump." And she said, "We lived in a penthouse in Chicago." Um, she said, "My mom and Ted Braden both drove newer model Mercedes Benz, and she always wondered why they were able to live that well on a truck driver's salary." Well, yeah. Braden was doing things like staging for his his cab to be stolen with the goods inside, so he did have a criminal record of some pretty nice. crime. So you have the crime background there too. Plus, sure. he's a dead ringer for the Cooper sketch. Uh, if you read all the Cooper files and all the witnesses that saw D.B. Cooper, there's one overriding feature that he had. Um, and people think it's probably the second one here, but the first one was he was swarthy is what they call it. He had dark skin. Now, they all said he was a white male, but he had dark, dark skin. Well, I unearthed a photo of Ted Braden from 1975 where he's sitting next to his mother who's very pale and looking compared to him. He had this very dark skin and he has that that Cooper look. And I remember when I sent that photo to uh, my friend, Darren Schaefer, who has a podcast called the Cooper Vortex, which everybody, if you like D.B. Cooper, you can't get by without the Cooper Vortex. It's so good. And For sure. Every suspect, every, even the funny ones, but Darren's great at it. You know, I hope he does something when he ever closes Cooper up. If he does keep do something else, he's so good at it. But I remember when I sent him that photo of Braden, his reaction was like, Whoa, you know, he couldn't believe it. Um, you know, and I knew I was on to something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, I think I think we'll pretty much let Drew go, guys, because uh, this is about uh, how long we're supposed to do. I just want to fire one last thing on you because I saw a couple UFOs on your channel. I'm a big UFO guy. Uh, did you see something in this COVID relief bill that they're supposed to do disclosure after like 180 days? That, that, I haven't heard of that. That'd be great yeah. if they did. I think, I mean, I don't know what level of disclosure that is, but uh, it's kind of interesting. There were a lot of rumors that, that Trump might do disclosure, um, you know, as the end of the campaign, because obviously saw how that went. But uh, there, this rumor kept coming up that, you know, there might be some some UFO announcement. I know that comes across in American media every, every like few years, but, you know, it's always interesting to see if. Yeah, they always get your hopes up and they don't do it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, it never happens. But, yeah, I'm a firm believer in Roswell. I think Roswell yeah, happened. Same, same. Uh, I met a guy that worked for Unsolved Mysteries when they did their Roswell show, which was one of the best. And yep. he met a lot of the living witnesses. You know, they were still alive at the time. I think that show was done in 87. Uh, yep. His name's Sam Lucchese. He was a production director for that particular episode. And he told me personally, because my cousin was friends with him, he said, man, I never believed in UFOs, but I met those people when we shot that show. And I'm telling you, they're telling you, telling the truth. He goes, I, they were honest, sincere, and I believe every one of them. And that left a huge impression on me. Yeah, I've been researching Roswell for years. I've been researching UFOs since a very young age. I've seen every episode of Ancient Aliens, some good, some bad. But uh, I've also read all the, you know, uh, Sitchin and Von Daniken and all the stuff that, you know, Ancient Aliens is obviously based on. Uh, but, yeah, I saw some UFOs on your channel when I was doing Zodiac, and I was like, oh, nice, one of my guys. Yeah, I think that's my daughter's favorite. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right, Bob guys. Lazar is Bob Lazar. <laughs> yes, I, I like that one that was on Netflix, too. You know, like, they give that guy a lot of crap, but, like, he really doesn't seem like he's doing it for attention, you know? Not that I know yeah, either way. I don't but... really believe Lazar. I believe there's, there, I think, I believe there's aliens, but I, yeah. I, I think Lazar is, is, I don't know if he's totally truthful. He's, like, what his he's saying. Uh, is approvable. <laughs> It hurts his credibility, but I mean, and this comes from somebody that I believe in him. You know, I believe we have a craft. I'm yeah, yeah, sure. I just don't know if I believe Lazar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's 
there's nothing lo- wrong with saying like, hey, I believe the topic, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna every single guy who pops up on the internet. Oh yeah, yeah, he's got it. You know, it's definitely this guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> can't do that. Anyway, y'all, uh, shout out to everybody who came through. Shout out to everybody from the Zodiac Killer Forum, uh, Facebook, Reddit. Drew Beeson, uh, subscribe to his channel. Drew Beeson on YouTube, the Zodcast. Sighting in on the Zodiac. Get that uh, book on Amazon. Drew Hurst Beeson on Instagram, uh, your your website, or anywhere else you'd like people to find you or your That's work? It, uh, uh, DrewBeesonBooks.com. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And um, hopefully I can get you. Oh, I, I know you had like a paranormal experience. I think you wrote something on it. Next time I get you back, uh, we'll do UFOs and some of that other stuff. Yeah, I, think I love the paranormal too. I'm, I'm probably going to get more back into that again. Same here. I, I read a lot of fiction too. So hopefully once I uh, bang out some of your uh, case studies, I can get into some of your fiction work as well. Uh, shout out to this. My man, Bat Falcon said, uh, Rendlesham, that's that, that crazy case of the UK Brindlesham, base. They say, uh, our friend David Young, uh, Paranormal UK, Rendlesham. He yeah, that one. David that, Young, Paranormal yeah, UK, that, check him out. That, <laughs> that's been on everything. That's a cr- crazy case on the US base out there. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's the Roswell of uh, the UK. Yeah. Absolutely. Shout out to uh, everybody who came through, especially shout out to Drew. Hopefully we can get him back sometime, and I'm hoping to have more Zodiac Files interviews and episodes of my new series coming soon. Thank you, everybody.